Malaysian 370, contact Ho Chi Minh 120, decimal 9. Uh, good night. Uh, good night, Malaysian uh, 370. Breaking news tonight, a Malaysia Airlines flight with 239 people on board, including four Americans, has gone missing. Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to the stream tonight. Technology tonight with Ashton Forbes. Can you imagine if that was our stream name that we had going on? It's a pretty good one. Um, thank you guys for being here tonight. I appreciate everybody who is already in here in the chat. We're already going on really quickly. Yo, what's up, Nicole? Hey, what's going on? Braza Brian, Christian, Bonza, Evan, Zialpino, any crazer. Any Zerkrazer, John, Matt, good to see you, man. Blake, Sham6, glad to have everybody out here tonight. Sorry we haven't been online the last couple nights. Uh, as you guys know, I had a computer get fried, and that was pretty annoying. Um, but I did get it fixed. Did end up just being a uh, power supply issue, so it was a pretty simple fix. I didn't lose any data. Yes, I will be backing up my data on even one more source now, so we're going to have like three or four redundant locations where all the data is being saved. <laughs> when you're talking about some crazy stuff, you've got to make sure that your data is protected, everybody. Um, so tonight, what are we going to be talking about tonight? Well, the big thing, first of all, is the redacted podcast. The redacted podcast I did at Appearance, I finally got around to watching it all, uh, took some notes. I was even impressed with my own appearance on there. I thought that was awesome. Uh, I was even getting a little emotional watching it. Uh, listening to Clayton. I mean, Clayton is a seasoned anchor that worked on Fox News. Uh, you know, he knows and then speaks to Tucker Carlson. So I was extremely excited um, from with just talking to him about the case. I think the way that all the information played out. And so for the people that are new or the people that have been here for a while, I do want to go uh, through a number of different clips from that interview. It just got posted to Twitter uh, like an hour ago. So if you want to watch it on Twitter, you can watch it full on Twitter. Otherwise, uh, go and watch it on YouTube or watch it on uh, Rumble. I, I was looking at the total numbers. I think it's already got over 300, 350,000 views. Uh, so quite a lot of people have watched it. And I'm really excited for the positive reception. I expected more negative comments. Um, and there wasn't nearly as many as that I thought. So we're going to go over that. Uh, before we do that, we're probably going to look at the Mentor Pilot video. Uh, and review some components to that as well. So if you've been following along on my Twitter, you've seen the Mentor Pilot showed up finally after a while. He made a video, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, and I got pinged on it like I get pinged on every single MH370 thing. So I ended up watching it. And truth be told, I was pretty disappointed. Uh, I think that you can tell when people don't do full, real investigations and deep dives into the evidence. And instead, they rely on, oh, I'm just going to read the official report and then I'm going to write something about it. It's like there's so much more than the official report to this case. And to do it justice, you absolutely must go back through the totality of the evidence, all the witnesses, 
all the old press conferences and everything else related to it. When you do that, you begin to see the real picture of what happened to this plane, um, not just what the official report that says it's out there. Now, we will go through, uh, I think we'll start by going through some of that information as well uh, regarding the mentor pilot drama back and forth, because I want you guys to see the type of situation we're dealing with here. I think you need to understand if you are following this case, if you are following me, you need to understand that we are dealing with a situation that's so far beyond the paradigm that I think you could call this catastrophic disclosure uh, something that people are just simply not ready to accept. And this goes along with all of the uh, pilots and experts and officials that have dug into the case. The reason why this case is out there that is so, uh, so, so difficult for people to solve is that the answer is not something that's palatable. It's not a simple answer. This is why it, it breaks people's minds. is because they're looking for something that they can absorb that makes sense to them. And the answer is, this does not make sense for the vast majority of people that are out there. And that's the reason why what I think what I'm doing is so important is that it is shining a light on a case and the, the huge amount of evidence for a case that simply does not have a simple conventional answer. It is not as simple as some pilot went rogue for no reason for eight hours and somehow knocked everybody out. So, um, somebody asked, "Is uh, does does your computer play Crisis? <laughs> I don't think it can play Crisis. I don't know. I haven't played video games in a while. Um, so let's take a look here. Let's see. I love Mentor Pilot's videos. I agree. I don't think his style of investigation works for this type of story. Yeah, I think for him, his style of investigation, from what I watched, works better where you already know what happened." And he's going through the mind of the person who knows what occurred um, because that's a very conventional type of explanation. What happened with MH370 is not a suicidal pilot. Uh, there's no chance of that whatsoever. There's not even any evidence for it. Um, and I thought, as we'll get into, it was pretty distasteful the way that he tries to psychoanalyze specifically this uh, very mundane communication. Uh, and, and essentially uses it as some type of evidence for why the people were in distress, which uh, I listen to it. There's, I, I don't, I don't hear that at all when I listen to it. And the problem I have with that type of thing, and we'll dig into this here in a second, but is that if you're the type of person who is going to adhere to the official narratives, then don't be a giant hypocrite and contradict those very same narratives when it doesn't, when it doesn't please you or when you're trying to generate clicks for money for people. Uh, that's the thing that I don't like. Um, so before we get into that, let's go take a look at the Twitter posts uh, so that you guys can see what we're talking about here. I'm going to share my screen. You're going to see a picture of myself here as well because I'm also streaming at the same time. Okay, let's change this. Okay. Okay, so first of all, there is the interview with Redacted. You guys see here, go ahead and watch that. If you haven't watched the Redacted interview, you absolutely must watch it. It's only about an hour uh, and 20 minutes long. So it's a very easy watch compared to some of the other uh, podcasts and interviews that I've done out there. Um, now, if we go take a look at... Oh, also, I guess let's, let's do a little bit of quick uh, messaging in the notes here. This Kona Blue document, which is, I guess, declassified by the AARO, who I'm still waiting on a response back from. If I do talk to them soon and they are comfortable with me disseminating the information I, I, I get from them, I will post it. Uh, but if they do ask me to keep the information quiet, then I may not do so. But this uh, document was very interesting. I pulled out a couple of notes from it. You can find a link down here at the bottom if you guys want to check it out. Um, justification for need. Remote vision, remote communication, and dematerialize and rematerialization techniques to observe, communicate, retrieve data, and transfer matter across dimensional and space-time barriers will undoubtedly be of utmost interest, if not a top collection priority, for adversarial intelligence and security services. What? This is from 2018, or 2008. So this is actually a what is that 16 year old document 
So when people read this or, you know, if people would have read this in 2008, people would have just thought this is wild. Like this is too far beyond the paradigm. But after we've watched the MH370 videos, which supposedly took place in 2014, um, does absolutely make you wonder what's going on with this type of stuff. Do we actually have this warp kind of technology? It seems like we've been talking about it for many, many years. This is almost two decades. And then later on near the bottom of the document, document's 56 pages. You guys can take a look at it yourself. If you find out any other um, interesting aspects to it, then go ahead and uh, let me know. Shoot them over to me. Um, also, people are telling me there's something weird going on with YouTube. So I'm just going to take a quick look at it. Um, just want to make sure it's working. No, it seems like it should be fine. Okay. The second part says applications and engineering. Associated exotic technologies likely involve extremely sophisticated concepts within the world of quantum mechanics, nuclear science, electromagnetic theory, gra gravitics, and thermodynamics. Given that all of these have potential to be used with catastrophic effects by adversaries, an unusually high degree of operational security and read-on discretion is required. Wow. That's pretty bizarre. Um, this, to me, when I read these concepts right away, what stuck in my mind, and remember, this is from 2008, 2009, quantum mechanics, what they're talking about here is quantum mechanics and, and general relativity, a unification theory. They're talking about getting quantum effects at large scales. Nuclear science, they're talking about cold fusion. They're talking about low energy nuclear reactions here. They're talking about basically free energy. Electromagnetic theory, they're talking about scalar uh, potentials. The idea that our electromagnetic understanding of theory is not complete. And then gravitics is uh, the idea that we can manipulate gravity, obviously. The thermodynamics part's interesting. I'm not sure what the relationship is there. It could be when we look at the orbs and we see that heat signature in the orb, that could be something that is, we're talking about there. Not sure. So this, to me, I thought was very interesting. There's also some context here around special access programs and how the information is kept secret, which is all consistent with everything that we put out there. Take a look at that. Now, the other thing I wanted to mention, you can find some more stuff that I've reposted here about the double slit experiment and superconductivity, which I think are very important if you guys want to understand what are the requirements are for this type of technology. Um, there was another big update that came out yesterday. So let's start with, let's go backwards through the drama, the mentor pilot drama. Okay. So woke up and found uh, a reply on here. And yeah, please feel free to make sure if you are following on YouTube, please feel free to make sure you like and I guess subscribe. Appreciate that. Um, and if you're following on Twitter, consider following on YouTube as well. Uh, I'm not sure it really matters that much, but I appreciate you either way. I uh, woke up, what was this yesterday morning? And saw a reply here and says, whenever somebody uses teleportation as an actual theory, you should probably look the other way. Now, to me, this is a very offensive comment to make, especially in a situation where you haven't dug in any research whatsoever. You've done no investigation. All you did was uh, read an official report and make a YouTube video where you got, I don't know, like two million views, where you're potentially making tens of thousands of dollars, where you have in your video in the middle of it, you have a promotion. Use code PILOT for 60% off, where you're literally grifting off of what happened with the situation where there's no answer, when you're a literal grifter, and then you're going to come and you're going to try to put down other people's real investigations and dismiss their actual evidence and theories because, oh, if somebody uses a teleportation, then you should just completely ignore them. Well, here's my counter argument. When a pilot doesn't even know that lithium ion batteries are banned in the cargo bay of passenger planes, and this plane was stacked with 500 pounds of them, and they completely ignore that and say, oh, that's not dangerous at all. Then I think you should probably ignore everything that pilot has to say. You know what? Why don't we put Mentor Pilot on an airplane with 500 pounds of lithium ion batteries in the cargo bay that were put together that day that missed two security screenings? And let's see how comfortable he feels flying on a six to eight hour flight. So that's my uh, that's me being as nice as I can be 
in that situation where someone's going to dismiss your stuff. So my follow-up was, sorry, I haven't got around to eviscerating your money grab YouTube video yet. I just want to point out to you, you, a pilot, claimed that hundreds and thousands of pounds of lithium-ion batteries wasn't dangerous in your cargo bay. LMFAO. <laughs> that was the moment I knew you were hilariously wrong. Then when you leaned on the phony whisper data where the guy who invented it says it can't even be used to track planes. And I know you didn't read it, unlike me, uh, who did, because you'd immediately see how silly the claims were. And we're going to get into those here as well. Please stop profiting off vilifying an innocent man. If you want to discuss the actual facts of MH370, you can reach out to me anytime. I'd be happy to do a live debate so people can watch. Come prepared. So if you guys have seen my uh, interviews, my podcast, you know that I'm not afraid of anybody out there. I'm not afraid of moron YouTubers like Danny Jones and Julian Dory. I'm not afraid of uh, going up with very intelligent people like Clayton Morris and talking to them as well. And I'm certainly not afraid of some YouTuber pilot guy who basically read a few pages of an official report and then put out a, a whole video where he starts to psychoanalyze the inflections in uh, mundane communications. Not even remotely close to afraid of somebody like that. Somebody who didn't even look up any of the witnesses. So this was a little bit rude, but at the same time, so was this. Um, so then I did my follow-up. I want to apologize to Mentor Pilot for being overly hostile. I don't like when people callously dismiss the massive amount of work that this community and myself have put into uncovering the evidence around what happened to MH370. Now, this is where it's not just me, guys. It's all of you guys as well. All the people in the Discord who's helped out and everybody who's on social media in the beginning as well who went through the evidence. Like Those types of responses are the problem that we face with uh, the, the bigger world in general is that for many people, what happened to this plane is not something that they can wrap their brain around. Because like the debunkers say, if this is real, then they had also have to uh, give credence to uh, other conspiracy theories that are out there that are uh, hard to believe as well. Because if you can pull off disappearing a plane and convincing the world of a lie and fabricating satellite pings and maybe faking a cloud picture and various other debunks out there, then yeah, it means that there is massive amounts of conspiracy that occurs that the intelligence community can get away with. Now, investigating isn't about cherry picking and coming up with a palatable answers that can that people can accept. It's about finding the truth, no matter how hard it is to believe. Yes, I am claiming that we can warp a 777 from one location on Earth in the blink of an eye through gravitational manipulation via mixed wave interferometry. I'm not a scientist. I'm just an investigator, and the science seems to check out. Everything from Suskind and Maldacena's ER equals EPR, which is a unification theory, to Thomas Bearden's scalar physics based on Tesla's work. That shows an underlying dimension of unlimited neg entropy exists. The exact thing we need to make a wormhole, at least to make one that's humanly traversable. Now, I'm not claiming this because it's a fantastic story, although it absolutely is. I'm claiming it because that's what the totality of the evidence concludes. Evidence that originated with two perfectly in sync military videos with no discrepancies on a single frame that were published weeks after the plane disappeared in 2014, where there was a $150,000 bounty for the hoaxer that no one claimed. No hoaxer ever came forward with a single shred of evidence. Just wrap your mind around that, guys, for $150,000. People go, well, he was probably dead. What, what was he, 70 years old? Oh, well, you just didn't care about $150,000. Yeah, right. You put out these hoax videos that you're trying to hoax the world and you don't want to collect $150,000? What? Any investigation into MH370 should begin with the log basic logical questions. So this is my uh, challenge to anybody else like Mentor Pilot or anyone who wants to make a video about MH370. If your investigation and your video doesn't begin by asking these questions, you are going to get eviscerated. How could there be no debris field? First question, answer that. How can there be no debris field? They found no debris field anywhere. How did no country satellites see the plane or the debris field where it crashed. Do people really think that satellites are real-time only? 
that we don't have records of every satellite imagery that's ever happened, that we don't think we could, we could go back to the satellite database right now and we could pull up satellite imagery from 10 years ago. I'm a hundred percent certain. How did no country satellites not see the plane or the debris field? Just wrap your brain around that. How did none of the over-the-horizon radars, which can see for thousands of miles, not track the plane, including Australia's Jorn system? There's a 0% chance the system wouldn't have seen the plane in the South Indian Ocean. It probably could have tracked it from takeoff. And that's just the Jorn system. There's more, like Diego Garcia, Pine Gap. How did the SOSA system which heard a tiny sub implode, not hear a 777 crash into the ocean. There's two other hydrophone systems as well. How does a piece of engine cowling, which is like a little piece of paper, basically, of the engine, the thing, actually, a piece of engine cowling ripped off a Southwest engine while it was taking off, like last week. How does a piece of engine cowling drift 3,000 miles to Africa? in like 500 days how does that work especially when the drift analysis or the the um the the ocean uh currents drift to the east the ocean currents drift in a circle based on the location where the plane crash it should have drifted up and washed up into australia and then lastly why did no debris wash ashore in australia despite the currents flowing to the east Start by proving the lie. MH370 did not crash into the South Indian Ocean. It's really that simple. So we start by proving the lie. Anybody else who's not out there proving the lie, um, they're not doing the investigation justice. So some of the back and forth that I had with Mentor Pilot was, and I'm not going to dig through all the replies in here, but we went back and forth quite a bit. Um he said, actually, you know what? I think we will look at a couple of them. I think we will look a couple. Here he goes. I was very clear about the fact that Whisper was a technology that was questioned. That's why I presented two scenarios. Why well, present it at all? There's no evidence that Whisper data is correct at all. If he had read the Whisper report, which we will go through in a minute, he would know that there's no chance the Whisper report is accurate. My video was made to restart the search. And it was cleared beforehand by the families of the victims. Which family members? The ones that say that somebody abducted the plane? The ones that say they don't believe the pilot's suicide myth? Where, when is the search going to restart? Where exactly does Mentor Pilot think the plane went down? Where exactly does Mentor Pilot think they should search? It's been a month and a half since the 10-year anniversary. And people had said, oh, the new search is going to happen any minute now. Everyone knows where the plane is. Where's the search? I'm not afraid of the search. The families have never reached out to me. I would love to talk to them. Maybe Mentor Pilot can connect us. I have several statements on them on shows such as CNN. How is it that how many think uh, how many of the family members think a rogue pilot crashed into the ocean without leaving a debris field? Where was his response to this? None. Because when people like this are challenged on just basic logic, this isn't complex or anything, just basic logic, they completely shut down. When you are a net uh, NPC, I think it's very important people understand what the term NPC means, because you're going to hear it a lot. NPC refers to a non-player character. It is the idea that you are one of the uh, non-main characters in a video game, where when people interact with you, all they get is one line of text of script. And if you try to ask them to think for themselves, they just keep repeating that one line of script. Mentor Pilot is an NPC, a non-player character, as well as many other people that are out there. These are not even real human beings as far as I'm concerned. They're people that can't think for themselves, where the only thinking they can do is whatever they've been told to think by TV or by their trusted authorities. This is the biggest problem we have in the entire world today. It's not a matter of corruption or anything else. It's a matter of literal NPCs. People that just simply cannot think for themselves. When challenged with basic questions, they completely break down and then they give some excuse. Well, you offended me, so I'm not going to respond. What? 
How about just use basic reasoning and we wouldn't even be in this situation to begin with? Whether or not people are afraid to lose their jobs and things like that, which I see people mentioning here, it's irrelevant. If you are afraid to speak the truth, then don't have a YouTube channel. Don't make a, a video about the case. If you can't answer the basic questions, then you have no business doing anything about the case whatsoever. You're not helping at all. So in the case of Mentor Pilot here, he thinks he's helping the investigation. He didn't help the investigation at all. There's no search happening. This, they're not going to search because they know they're not going to find the plane because you didn't point to anywhere on the map where they should go search. They've already searched everywhere. They searched above and below water everywhere along the seventh arc. So either the satellite pings are wrong and that plane can be anywhere or those satellite pings are right. And you got to show me exactly where they should, they should search that they didn't already search. This is why they're not searching again. This is why making videos about whisper route data and trying to vilify the pilot or don't help the situation at all. Cause we already know that's not possible. All you did was present information that is the already been conclusively ruled out. What we need are new ideas, ideas and people that aren't afraid to think outside the box about what might have happened. Almost like if we had like two videos that show what really happened to the plane. Oh, wait, we do have two videos that show exactly what happened to the plane. And we're just going to dismiss them because it's too hard for us to wrap our brain around even though it shows the plane on the real location where the plane supposedly turned into the South Indian Ocean, the same place where people say it flew for five or six more hours to the South Indian Ocean where we didn't find anything. Hmm. I think that people need to go back to using basic common sense and reasoning. Whether or not you think something is possible is irrelevant. The, what really matters is what the evidence shows. So speaking of the debunks real quick, before we get into the uh, analysis of Mentor Pilots video, um, and, and I don't think it's going to be too long because we've already talked about quite a bit of it, and I'm already coming down harshly enough on him, and I don't want to come down too harshly. I do want to use him as an example, though, for other people that think that they're going to make videos about MH370 and go unchallenged. You, you will be challenged if I, I have put together more evidence than anyone on the planet, potentially, and if you are out there ignoring that evidence, you will get challenged, just like Ross Colhart did when he did his reality check with that uh, phony expert, Larry Vance or whatever, who like wouldn't even address the fire scenario, who falsely claimed he knew exactly what happened to the plane. Like These people are total clowns, and I will clown on them in the way that they are accustomed to. Okay, so uh, somebody found a fourth situation where the Pyromania VFX was used so if people are not familiar, there are two prominent debunks out there. One of them comes from Mick West, who is a unemployed uh, serial debunker who doesn't use any common sense or rationality in his approach. And it has been promoted uh, by frauds, the Corridor crew, uh, who are fake VFX experts, who apparently don't know how VFX works, uh, who sit on a couch and splice cartoons into their reaction videos. This is how dumb these guys are. While wearing hoodies and Jordy LaForge glasses. I wish I was kidding. I am not. They are complete and utter morons. Uh, if you follow the Corridor crew, I suggest you unfollow them and uh, get a brain. Now, this Pyromania VFX, you can tell just looking at it right here, overlaid, is not in our video. When you use stock effects, the whole point of stock effects is that you do not have to manipulate it, is that you can take that stock effect and you can put it into your video, and now you have something in your video. And so eyes to see here found a fourth situation where this stock effect has been used. It has been used in the Killing Time video game from the 90s. It has been used in a advertisement recently for Attack on Titan, an anime. It has been used in Starship Troopers, the cult classic movie from the 90s as well. And it was used in Eastbound and Down. Here's the segment. Fine. Boom, there it is. So you saw the explosion right there. Uh, I'll go back to it one more time. You can see it right here. There's the explosion. Notice they didn't change it to black. They didn't remove the frames. They didn't make any other adjustments to it. They just changed the angle of it, and that was about it. So again, 
stock effects you don't change every aspect of them this frame right here is the only frame that's close it doesn't even match along the border it's not the right color the middle is completely different and it's cut off all over the edges here as well the other frames are not even remotely close not even remotely close this stock effect is objectively as a statement of fact not in the mh370 videos anyone who says it does is a liar i don't know how to put it any more simply than that um the whole point of this stock effect and the fact that they only show you one frame they only show you this and they try to compare it goes to show how completely 100% dishonest people like Mick West are, the Corridor crew are. The Corridor crew doesn't even compare the actual effect to it. They change the effect, and then they compare a falsified version of the effect to the video in their video. That's how dishonest the Corridor crew are. So if you think the videos are debunked, you're wrong. Not even close, guys. Not even close. The sad part is this is what happens with NPC mentality. Because NPCs and Redditors are the type of people that when they are wrong, they absolutely will never admit they're wrong. And instead, they will just continually double down on the most insane, illogical, and incorrect things there are. So um, that's the difference. And what you'll find as well from the debunkers is that they will uh, have they will falsely claim that they know stuff that they can't possibly know. And they will falsely claim things are 100% when they are not, when they can't possibly know them to be. So. This is more than just MH370 videos, but in general, you need to be very skeptical of debunks that are out there. I would say a vast majority of debunks in general are completely false. Uh, and now I think there was one more thing. Okay, yeah, so the other thing here as well as this. Um, and where'd this guy go? Oh, and so here's another NPC real quick as well. Um, so another one of these air safety guys, this guy's got uh, 35,000 followers um on on twitter thirty five thousand followers and all he does is grift people online and just repost uh airline accidents and when i look through his content his content gets less than five likes on most of his stuff that's out there basically no one interacts with any of his content out there how is this person have thirty five thousand followers but this is the problem with like idiot NPCs that are out there is that they make claims. Like, By the way, I followed you just so I can report all your content as fake news. Imagine being this effing stupid and being this guy. Guys, never be like this on disasters person in your whole life. Never be like this. This is just a straight embarrassment to the entire human race right here. I followed him. He actually didn't follow me. I'm going to unfollow because I challenged him to a debate. I've challenged all these people to debate. I, I challenged Mentor Pilot to a debate. Uh, I challenged this uh, whatchamacallit guy here. Um, I'm going to unfollow this guy because he's not really worth following at all. Obviously, there's no point following people that only read off a script. I can get that information from an AI if I want. Um, and none of them, of course, uh, uh, came up to the debate. So these people are all cowards. You know, the reality is they're all cowards. Um, none of them are willing to debate the facts because they know they're not going to last five minutes. As they know they're going to get proven wrong within five minutes, they're going to look like idiots and they're going to come off terribly. Um, I'm not afraid of debating anybody out there. And just for the record, Mick West has dodged me four different times on debates where podcasters try to set up a debate with us because he knows he would have got destroyed too. He knows I would have shown the world that he lied about that pyromania VFX, that he's the source. He knows that the first question I'm going to ask him is, what is his job and how does he make money? Um, and he knows it's not going to be some kind of cushy bullshit interview where everybody else just doesn't ask him any hard questions whatsoever. Guy's a complete and total clown. So is On Disasters. And sadly, so is Mentor Pilot. So I look forward to debating you on stream. Let me know when we can set it up. You can bring any expert you want with you. So here's my challenge again. Any expert you want, you can bring your physicist. You can bring Neil deGrasse Tyson. You can bring Eric Weinstein. You can bring uh, any pilot you want, any official you want, any supposed investigative expert you want. I will take on them all. And I'll take on them all multi versus one. You want to line them up in the room and we can all debate together. I'll take them on three on one. Doesn't matter. That's how confident I am in my understanding of the plane as well as the evidence that's out there. 
people like this don't think for themselves. People like this never step up to a challenge. Um, and it goes to show just how pathetic they are in general. Okay. Now, the last thing before we get to the videos here, and we'll start digging into this tonight. I think we're going to go for about two hours. Now, an amazing article came out yesterday. Guys, the videos are real. And the case that I've put forth is what really happened to the plane. How do I know? Because I'm on record talking about it since October. That was six months ago, seven months ago. That's since I started doing podcasts. I'm the person who's been promoting the fire theory. We found the glowing orange plane. And we went through the glowing orange plane. That's how we found out of a fire. I'm the person that's been saying we have eight witnesses on a boat that saw the plane flying low right after the turnaround. So what came out? Secondly, a new article shows up. With an, they've done an analysis of the turn. The data reveals that the aircraft may have experienced a depressurization after the turn off the flight, pla the flight plan track. It shows that the aircraft was operated at FL-300 or FL-320 or a combination of both. Notably, it appears an emergency descent then occurred, supporting the team's theory of a depressurization event having taken place. Guys, when you depressurize a plane, if you are flying low, it's because you're trying to get the passenger's oxygen to breathe. You have to fly under 10,000 feet. If you are flying high, that's where you would asphyxiate the passengers. This evidence conclusively proves that the pilot suicide narrative is a myth. If the pilot was locking somebody out and depressurizing the plane, they would increase altitude near to 40,000 feet. Therefore, everyone would succumb from hypoxia within minutes. If you're flying low, it's because it's an emergency event and you're trying to save the passengers. And that's what the pilot was trying to do. Now, what kind of scenario would there be an emergency event where you'd have a depressurized plane? How about batteries exploding and the batteries go on fire and potentially damage the plane, depressurizing it, or you're intentionally depressurizing it because you need to give oxygen to the passengers since the fire extinguishing devices that automatically go off suck oxygen out of the plane. This evidence right here pretty much proves the fire scenario. It proves that this suicide narrative is a myth. So the rest of my context here is maybe our resident pilot expert, mentor pilot, can help us out with this new analysis of the Malaysian radar, which shows MH370 attempted an emergency descent with a manual turnback. The manual turnback is important as well. The moment the plane starts on fire, you're taking control of the plane and you're turning back to go to the nearest airport where you can land safely. Keep in mind, you're at 35,000 feet, so you're not going to be able to land in the airport that's only a few miles away. The way the planes work is you got to go pretty far. So Penang is the one that makes the most sense. So this is my questions. The mentor replied. Do you guys think he answered any of the questions? Before we get there, go ahead and put your predictions in the chat. Why would a pilot depressure as a plane to fly low? To knock everyone out, you'd fly at high altitude. Flying low would indicate you're attempting to provide oxygen for the passengers. Why would you turn and fly to the nearest airport that can accommodate a 777? Beeline directly at it. Why, when I check a bag on a flight or mail a letter at the post office, do they ask me if there's any lithium-ion batteries inside? Why are lithium-ion batteries banned in the cargo of passenger planes? Apparently, people don't know this. I've had a lot of people fight me about this. Yes, lithium-ion batteries are banned banned in the cargo of passenger planes, period. There is no safe way to travel a store with them. They are banned because a lot of planes burnt up. Like it was, you go look at the situations between 2010 and 2014. It was a disaster. A number of planes burnt up. Even after they've outlawed them, even afterwards, the last two years, there's been 74 incidents of lithium ion batteries in the passenger area of cargo planes. 74 each year. That's over a one per week in the United States. They are extremely, extremely dangerous. This lower altitude is also corroborated by eight real fishermen who are on a boat off the coast of Thailand and Malaysia, right about where my mouse is right over here. 
that saw the plane flying low at 1730 UTC. This is 10 minutes after the turn back. The same time, another 777 pilot not wanting to be named heard the pilots with static on the radio. Do any other pilots want to weigh in? The reason why Mentor Pilot's not going to respond to this is because he knows 100% that the protocol here is for a fire emergency event. Any pilot that's flown up a commercial airliner knows exactly what happened with this plane. The batteries ignited. They were on fire. This was an emergency event. They were descending low in order to get the passengers oxygen. It's corroborated by eight real witnesses 10 minutes later. What more do you want? The, uh, the evidence here it now is supported by both the real people as well as the data in addition to that. This rules out any type of pilot suicide narrative. So let's see what his response was. I thought he responded. Oh, there it is. I love that you link an art, the article that, with the exception of the emergency descent, goes on to say exactly what I say in the video. Yeah, well, the emergency descent is pretty important, mentor pilot, because it completely rules out the scenario that you were trying to push in your video. And it proves what I've been saying correct. Does, do you see him uh, admitting that there was a fire event here in his post, guys? I don't see it. The emergency descent bit comes from a radar estimation of altitude, which couldn't be confirmed. Well, that's okay. We have eight witnesses that saw the plane. We have eight witnesses that saw the plane. I did him a favor doing a like on there. I'm going to unlike it because, like I said, we've got eight real fishermen on a boat who saw the plane at 1730. What scenario does this indicate? Did I miss the part in your video where you went over the emergency fire event? No, I didn't miss it. He definitely didn't go over it. How can you claim to be an honest person? And somebody who's trying to seek the truth, when you just ignore every piece of evidence that doesn't fit with your pre-programmed narrative. Also, I want to understand this as well from anybody out there. And this is me. I don't know the true answer. How can a pilot make an entire plane go dark between the last communication and it dropping off the radar, which was 64 seconds? Captain uh, Bellamy uh, suggested whoever was in command of the aircraft would have intentionally disconnected all four electrical generators and APU. That doesn't sound like something that a pilot can do from the cargo bed or from the, the uh, cockpit. This is practically impossible for a single person to disconnect all four electrical generators and APU simultaneously and within 64 seconds. And then what did people say? Um, Wall Street Advisor then says as well, it's not possible for a pilot to, to disable comms entirely, and they definitely can't block the satellite tracking. I don't see people emphasizing that. He has a communication here, and I think he also put a quote in here. Turning off the radios and ACARs would be more difficult. NPR's Jeff Brumfell spoke with commercial pilots, including two that have flown 777s. He says the pilots tell him that those systems are pretty hardwired into the modern aircraft. They say you'd have to go through big checklists. You'd have to possibly pull circuit breakers if you want to deactivate them. So to do this, you'd have to have some degree of premeditation and a lot of knowledge. Or here's a better example a scenario. They were on fire. Also, we have... Uh, I'm not going to be able to pull the link up. Actually, you know what? I think I have it. Hold on. Um, maybe I don't. There is... Uh, it. Maybe I don't have it. Hold on. There's also, I don't have it up with me right now, but there was a post saying that it was not something. Yeah, I don't have it right now. One of the experts that investigated, uh, the official uh, people basically said that it was, they were not under the impression this was something that could have been pulled off by the pilot as well. So you have to basically discount the officials, common sense, or anything to think that the pilot pulled this off. Now, let's switch gears here. No, I'm just going to be clear. You cannot make the plane go dark by yourself. Nobody has proven this. The officials have said that it was not something they think that a pilot could have pulled off. We've got sources right there as well saying that multiple pilots they spoke to is not a situation where you can simply disable everything. I think that people get confused because people give their opinions and they want to believe that the pilot could have pulled this off when there's no evidence for it whatsoever. In the one of the earliest press conferences as well, um, the 
Malaysian Minister of Transportation, I believe it was, was asked by a New York Times person, can you actually just make a plane go dark? Is that even a thing that they can do? And his response was, we don't know. We'll look into it. If it was the answer that they could, the answer would have been yes. That's something they can pull off. So I think that there's this myth out there that a pilot can supposedly make the plane entirely go dark. That is not something that I found any evidence to support whatsoever. Okay, let's keep going. Now let's go and take a look at... And once again, for people in the in the comments here, I don't know who you are or what your experience is. Prove it. Prove it. I'm not I'm not interested in listening to opinions of people that, that believe whatever they see on social media. Prove it. The official investigators have ruled it out. You already know more than them. Get into the case. Let them know. Okay, let's do a. Okay, here it is. Okay, we're going to briefly go through this. Not too long. Let me see. I've got some clips on this. Yeah, e even a, in a total electrical system, it still would show up on radar. Yeah, that, that's the thing that people don't realize. This is not something that feasibly could have been done uh, by the pilot. Okay, so uh, and I, I don't want to get uh, struck here, so I'm going to skim through some of this. The part I want to start with was the dangerous goods. So I think it's somewhere around. He talks about a car system. He does a ton of definitions and everything. Uh, I think it was somewhere around 1840. So we'll start right here. Notification to captain and it's normally sent out if the aircraft would be carrying dangerous goods. In this case, there were actually no dangerous goods on board. Just so Okay, you guys just hear that? There were no dangerous goods on board, he just said. Let's see what he says next. Because I heard that. I said, what, there's no dangerous goods on board. Are you sure about that? Have you looked at any of the information? Special load being loaded consisting of several tons of mangosteens, which apparently had a tendency to leak juice and water and therefore had to be checked closely. The NOTOC message confirmed that the cargo had been checked and that it wasn't leaking, but what it didn't say was that there was also nearly two and a half tons of lithium-ion batteries loaded on board. He's claiming there's two and a half tons of lithium-ion batteries. Just for my people out there, that's 5,000 pounds of lithium-ion batteries he's claiming. I'm only claiming there's 487. He's claiming 5,000, two and a half tons of lithium-ion batteries. He just said there was no dangerous cargo on board. I, You know what? We should have Mentor Pilot fly around on a plane with 5,000 pounds of lithium-ion batteries in the cargo bay. I just want to see how long he lasts. That is the definition of dangerous. We looked into these lithium-ion batteries, chat. We looked into them. I Clearly, Mentor Pilot didn't. Two pallets of them were stacked up in the forward cargo bay right next to the, the main equipment center, which is also known as Electronics Bay. Um, I'm not sure if you looked into that. They were put together that day. Do you guys know the most dangerous uh, way that lithium-ion batteries ignite is because they were assembled uh, incorrectly or have defects in them. So the fact they were put together that day would mean they're at the highest possible risk. It was over 100 degrees Fahrenheit that night. Uh, the batteries, that's not necessarily critical for the batteries, but in those cargo bays, if they heat up, they only have to get up to like 200 degrees, maybe even not even, and then they're going to ignite as well. Um, in addition to that, uh, the way they were put together, they were just stacked up on pallets. They missed two security screenings as well. I think missing two security screenings is pretty damn suspicious for 5,000 pounds or 500 pounds of lithium ion batteries. It's called thermal runaway. But these batteries were individually packed. And the moment that they get ignited, that whole thing is never going to stop burning. You can put it out, but they're going to just come back up again and again and again. These are extremely dangerous things. This is why they are outlawed, outlawed in the passenger or in the cargo bay of passenger planes, no matter what. You cannot ship them as cargo in passenger planes. You cannot have people with them in their checked bags in passenger planes because it's too dangerous. There's not people down there looking for the fires. You don't see it happen 
all of a sudden, kaboom. Packaged and stored in such a way that they were not considered dangerous goods. Um, they were stored in such a way that they were not considered dangerous goods. I would challenge Mentor Pilot or anyone else to go look at the ATSB report and look at the pictures in there. And you tell me that they look safe. They have got them stacked up. They look like IEDs. And then they just stack them up on a pallet in cardboard boxes. Is that going to, if one of them ignites, all of them are lighting up. That is not safe. Whatever not you think that the official reports is they were stacked, they were stored safely. If they were stored safely, they wouldn't be banned in the cargo bay of passenger planes. They have therefore been ruled out as a possible cause for what's about to happen. They've been ruled out because why? Because somebody says that they were stacked safely, that they don't mention they missed two security screenings, that they don't mention that they're banned in the cargo bay of passenger planes, that you claim that 5,000 pounds of them. This one right here is dangerous enough. This is one pound. Can you imagine having 5,000 pounds of those stacked up? I just I want to listen to it one more time because it's actually un unbelievable to me that a pilot can make this claim on a video. That's a cars. This is a digital data link system which connects data providers on the ground directly to the aircraft via either VHF or satellite communications. It enables people on the ground to send things like updated weather, flight plans, and even make calls or send messages directly to the aircraft when it's airborne. And the part of this system which is going to be most important here oh, is far back. Hold on. for notification to captain and is normally sent out if the aircraft will be carrying dangerous goods. In this case, there were actually no dangerous goods on board, just some special load being loaded. No dangerous goods on board, just a special load. Just want to repeat that one more time for you guys so you can hear from Mentor Pilot's first-hand mouth what he's claiming. He said that he's just reading off the ATSB report. So this is the part where it's hypocrisy checks. We're going to get to another part in a minute where he starts reviewing uh, the uh, inflection levels of the voice of mundane communications. Is that in the official report that he's just reading as well? Don't be a hypocrite. If you're going to take the official report and just do a video about the official report, then do that. You know what? Don't just make up a bunch of bullshit. But consisting of several tons of mangosteens, which apparently had a tendency to leak juice and water and therefore had to be checked closely. The NOTOC message confirmed that the cargo had been checked and that it wasn't leaking. But what it didn't say was that there was also nearly two and a half tons of lithium ion batteries loaded on board. But these batteries were individually packaged and stored in such a way that they were not considered dangerous goods. Individually packaged and stored in such a way where they're not considered dangerous. Just real quick, I want to show that clip, that, that video or that, that, that picture one more time from his that video. It wasn't leaking, but what it Dude, didn't say would was you feel that safe with these batteries that he, he shows here in a second? Does this look safe to you, chat? Does, does this look safe? If one battery in this package ignites, what do you think is going to happen? I'm pretty sure the whole thing's going to light up. And this isn't even all of them. He's just showing the sum. I think that there was even more lithium ion batteries than what we even have said with the 500 pounds. The ones that we saw were looked like they were stacked together like IEDs. And that's from the official report. I think it was page 255 and 256. If you guys want to check it out on the ATSB report for yourself. Okay, so that's the first claim. Absolutely ridiculous. It, whether or not you believe we can warp an airplane... Uh, I don't care. Don't believe it. That's fine. But to dismiss the fire emergency event, which is clearly what happened to this plane, which is supported by Mike McKay, who sees the plane on fire from his oil rig at the same time it, the plane goes dark. The eight fishermen, the nine people on the coast that hear loud noises the same time Mike McKay sees the fire. And then an hour and 20 minutes later, Catherine T sees the plane glowing orange, flying low, smoke coming out of the back of it, dark smoke. Uh, consistent with a chemical fire, you know, this is where if you're ignoring all of these people that are telling you what the situation was, the plane not just crashing, the plane turning to the Penang, going to the nearest airport that you would go to to land a plane. Um, to me, that's not helping the situation. That's not helping the case. This is only uh, muddy in the waters even further when you make statements like this. Um, I feel like I saw some questions as well. Yeah, Ashton, you're ignoring the science. Anything wrapped in cellophane can't catch fire. <laughs> like, what? like, can we just use logic, like basic common sense? Everybody, it's it's crazy to me, just completely crazy. 
the, you know, so the reason why, yeah, hot gases expand. Uh, the reason why they had to ignore this the reason why everybody has ignored the fire event is because this plane could not have made it to the South Indian ocean. And a lot of these people that are out there, these experts and what have you, they are pot committed to this plane having crashed in the South Indian ocean. Because if it didn't crash in the South Indian Ocean, now what's the prevailing theory? Where's the plane? Why did why didn't we find the plane in Straits of Malacca or the Andaman Sea? And the answer is the MH370 videos. Those are the reasons why we didn't find that plane down there. So this is why people can't accept the fire theory. It has nothing to do with the plausibility of the fire theory. They know that the fire theory is plausible. They can't accept it because it knows that then they have been pushing a lie. That's just the reality of it. Okay, so let me see if there's any other good questions before we move on to the next piece. Yeah, what's funny is after this event, there's lithium training and regulations put in place. I I agree. Uh, we looked into it, and it looks like they literally started to take lithium-ion batteries fire seriously right after this, which is like, guys, if you go look at the timeline, especially the FAA's website. In fact, I'll probably pull it up here for you guys real quick because it's actually pretty funny. Um, you can just Google FAA lithium ion battery fires and the very first link will be lithium ion battery fire incidents here. I'll, I'm going to change my share screen. Actually, is this going to mess it up? Hmm. And if it does, we can, we can get it back. No big deal. Here it is. Oh, no, it doesn't. Sweet. Look at this chat. Look where the data starts. 2015, the year after the plane goes missing, is when the lithium-ion battery incidents begin being recorded here. Look how many there are. Look at, and this is, they've the latest that they've been banned is by 2019. There's some arguments that some people have made that they started getting banned in 2015. It kind of depends on what regulation you look at. I dug through them all. It's kind of hard to sift through and understand. But the latest was, twenty by 2019, they were completely banned in the cargo bay of passenger planes. And you can tell why. Look how many incidents there were. Look how many there were just in 2022 and 2023, 74 and 76. There actually, there's two more than I thought last year. They must have added a couple more retro retroactively. And you can tell most of them are battery packs, e-cigarette devices, cellular phones, laptops, and other electronic devices. Anyone who says these aren't dangerous has no idea what they're talking about. Okay. Now, let's go to... The, now, to me, that was the most egregious issue in the Mentor Pilot video. Most egregious video issue. Um, let's switch this over. Oops. Ion batteries low. Okay. Now the next part I want to go to is the passengers. Okay. Um, hold on. Okay. Yeah, I took some notes here, so should be good. After the pushback, the aircraft received its taxi clearance and then started taxiing out towards runway 32 right through the dark Malaysian night. And for anyone watching the aircraft, everything looked completely normal. But this was going to be the last time anyone saw this aircraft with their own eyes. So what about the passengers then? Well, there were 227 passengers on board, coming from 14 different nations. 153 were from China, making those the largest group. Guys, 153 were from China. Now, this like this doesn't really add much, but it's useful. But if you're presenting a scenario of espionage between the United States and China, China doesn't have any reason to take down this plane. It's all their people on board. Followed by 50 from Malaysia and 7 from Indonesia. Two of those passengers were later found to have been flying on stolen passports, and they were identified as Iranians who were most likely looking for refugee status and were not considered a threat. Okay, did you guys just hear what I just heard? Two Iranian passengers are... Is there any wars going on right now? Oh, Iran is basically shooting missiles at Israel right now. Two Iranian passengers with stolen passports who changed their identity to look like the passports, not considered to be a threat? Excuse me, how can I take that seriously? We have a plane that went dark. We have no idea what happened to it, where even this video is presenting that someone took control of the aircraft and disabled it. And there's no evidence that the pilot did it. 
everybody is ruled to pilot out, including his wife, the officials, his coworkers, etc. No issues mental health wise, no red flags. We got two fake passengers on board with stolen passports. That's not considered to be a threat, not suspicious. Oh, well, let's find out what their cover story is. Guys, do you know what their cover story is? They were Iranian refugees trying to get to Amsterdam in Europe. What? In Malaysia? In Kuala Lumpur? Guys, have, we look, have you guys looked at a globe recently? If you need to go to Amsterdam, there's a direct flight from Kuala Lumpur to Amsterdam to the northwest. You just go up northwest. And you're paying tens of thousands of dollars for stolen passports. I don't think money is a problem. Why are you flying to Beijing? Why are you going to a communist Chinese country where you could potentially get caught if you were then going to fly from Beijing to Amsterdam using stolen passports? Every single leg that you do, every single checkpoint you have to go past is another risk. I think it's insane. Anyone who's presenting a hijack scenario or a scenario where someone took control of the plane, you absolutely must think that the two Iranian passengers on stolen passports are extremely, extremely suspicious. They were also traveling together. Also traveling together. Two Iranian passengers who are not related, both using stolen passports, both changing their appearance to look like the people in the passports, two of the only white people on board the plane. and. That's not weird to you at all? It's weird to me. So this is the part two where I'm, I'm getting really suspicious of the analysis that's being done in this video um, because it's not using basic common sense and basic rationality, unfortunately, especially with what's going to come next as well. Um, let's see. None of the other passengers raised any type of suspicion. And this means that in total, there were 200. None of the other passengers raised any kind of suspicion. How about the 20 freescale semiconductor scientists and engineers on board the plane? Has anybody ever worked for a large company before? One where you have intellectual property that you're too afraid to lose? Usually they have uh, rules that you can only have two to three people from the same company on board the same plane just in case the plane were to crash. So the company doesn't lose everything that it needs to operate. The passengers were sitting next to each other. Did Mentor Pilot find that out? No. Arwen from MH370X did. She looked up every passenger one by one, found out that all of them essentially were sitting next to each other. Some of them had their whole families with them. That doesn't seem suspicious. That doesn't raise any red flags, especially in a situation where we have a mysterious plane going completely dark and just never showing up anywhere and never finding any debris field for it. I think you probably want to start with the two people running on fake passports, and then you probably want to take a look at the 20 freescale semiconductor scientists and engineers. Oh, and the 20 freescale semiconductor scientists and engineers are connected to U.S. aerospace and defense through serving RF power needs. People have argued that they were working on advanced cloaking. People have argued that they uh, had connections to radar. They broke away from Motorola in 2004. The Freescale Semiconductor Company did because their technology was so paradigm shifting and not in uh, alignment with Motorola. The company was sold off the next year in 2015. Um, they were also connected by a 2005 National Security Agency report on the commercial emergence of superconductive microchips. If you're making a YouTube video and you're claiming to investigate the case, investigate the case. You know, I've already done all the work for you. All you literally have to do is read my evidence list and then just Google the things and confirm every single thing that I've been saying. Obviously, people that make these videos don't even do that much work. Um, which, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and say that I am just... Uh, I'm officially in at least the top three for MH370 investigators at this point. So if you're not at least doing the bare minimum, don't bother. I've done the work for you. I've made it publicly available. I don't have it behind any paywalls. I'm not charging you any money for it. Just read the evidence. All you have to do at a minimum. 139 passengers and crew on board when the giant Boeing 777 lined up on runway 32 right and started spooling up its engines. And I'll tell you all about what happened next, right after this. Talking about leaving traces, did you know that there's a whole industry out there known as data brokers who live off selling your digital traces off to the highest bidder? What they do is they snoop up things. 
Is he really doing an advertisement 10 minutes into his video? He's doing a in run in video advertisement, selling out time to a sponsor in the middle of his video. Use code pilot for 60% off. Are you kidding me, mentor pilot? Are you kidding me right now? You're selling me this bullshit that you're posting and now you're going to run. And how much money did you make from this in roll advertisement? How much money do you think that this guy made from this video in general? In fact, I'm going to go ahead and look right now. Because a lot of people get at me for being a grifter or whatever. No, this is real grifting right now. This is what real grifting is, chat. If you see me doing a video and then you see a mid-roll, a video about the case, 100% about the plane going missing. It's like if I was on Clayton's Redacted podcast in the middle of it, I'm going, and now you should go ahead and uh, go to McDonald's and get a cheeseburger. It's on sale, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> what? 1.87 million subscribers. How many follow? How many people watch the MH370 video that he has? 3.7 million views from one month ago. 3.7 million views. He probably made $50,000 off of this video. I'm just guessing. I'm extrapolating. I don't know that to be a fact, uh, but I've done my own numbers. Just to give you guys an idea, I've had only roughly 50,000 views or something like that per month. And the amount of money it generates in revenue is like $250, something like that. $300 maybe. Extrapolate that up. This is about 200 times that amount, times $200, $300. You're looking at tens of thousands of dollars minimum that doesn't even include how much he was paid to uh, do this in-roll advertisement as well. And everybody's allowed to make money. But if you are doing a shit-ass job of doing no investigative research whatsoever, and you ignore all the evidence, and you just muddy the waters, and then you claim that you're taking the moral high ground because you reached out to the families... And you're trying to restart the search that simply never happened. Uh, to me, that's the absolute pinnacle and height of hypocrisy. It is the definition of grifting. Okay. Now, um, the next thing I want to do is I'm gonna have I might have to search for this a little bit here. Okay, so there's this anomalous call. So the next thing is about 20 minutes in. You have to go through this whole thing, this whole commercial. Oh, here we go. He starts doing psychoanalysis of he finds there was a communication before the goodnight MH370. And he starts doing psychoanalysis as being a trainer and says, I noticed that there was some inflection in his voice. And therefore, he's basically trying to sell this idea that the pilot or the co-pilot was nervous because they were about to steal the plane. He doesn't say that directly, but that's the implication that he gives here. And he goes on this for several minutes as well. With his voice, that he was relaxed when he made this call, from the way that his intonation kind of dropped towards the end. And it's from here. Okay, you guys just heard that. There was nothing suspicious whatsoever about that. In fact, the officials have ruled out that there's nothing suspicious about that. Mentor Pilot is not a psychiatrist. He's not a mental health professional whatsoever. He has no basis to be doing this type of analysis at all. On that, I have a feeling that we can see the first indication of something being slightly out of order. Do you guys just hear what he just did right there? He's literally trying to vilify the pilot over this, over something that is completely mundane. We have the first idea that this something might be slightly out of order. What the hell are you talking about, man? This is the guy that thinks that teleportation is too hard to believe because you've got to believe peer-reviewed studies. Show me the peer review on the psychoanalysis of your uh, radio communication that you're doing right here, Mentor Pilot. Now, I want to make it absolutely clear that nothing in the final report has highlighted that whatever happened started as early as here. But I personally reacted to something that was just... so. He literally says that there is nothing in the official report that would indicate what he's about to say right now. This is the guy that claims to me that he was just reading off the official report. But now he's going rogue. Now he's going completely rogue. And now he's going to go ahead and just 
go ahead and grift for some more content and, and make up some completely false claims not supported by anything that's out there. Briefly mentioned in the report. You see, about seven minutes after the captain called in that they were leveled at flight of a 350, he called up again and reported the very same thing. In the report. Okay, did you hear anything suspicious in that chat? Sounded like a completely mundane conversation to me. Let's go back five seconds. Reported the very same thing. In the report. Sounds completely normal to me. There's clearly no stress in that person's voice, but not for mentor pilot. This was highlighted as anomalous, but the experts didn't think that it was worth paying any attention to. But I disagree. You see, we pilots tend to make these extra calls for two different reasons. The first is that we have just simply forgotten about it and therefore call again just to be on the safe side. But like I said earlier, this was not a mandatory call to make. The other reason we do it is because we've been away from the frequency for a while. Maybe because we have been fiddling with the radios or turned down the volume or something else. And we just want to make sure that ATC hasn't tried to call us while we were gone. Okay. You see, if we make that call again and ATC just previously tried to send. So with that in mind, there were seven minutes between the first call and the second call, which means so that dude something might have just happened to the take call. the captain away from the radio between those calls. The other thing that I reacted to was the tone of voice of the captain when he made that second call. The tone of voice? What is he talking about? Complete made up nonsense, not supported by anything. Again, the experts in the report said that no evidence that there was any stress or anxiety. I thought he was just reading off the report. This is what mentor pilot told me when I challenged him on the fire scenario and the batteries. Now he's going completely rogue off the report, completely rejecting the report, just making up completely unsubstantiated claims that he's not even credentialed to make. They couldn't detect any stress in the voice from the recordings, but what I am hearing is a clear difference in pitch between the first and the second call. In the first, the captain sounds relaxed with a clear dropping intonation towards the end, and in the second, he just sounds busy, like he's working on something at the same time that he's making that call. <laughs> Should we listen to it again, chat? I when I was listening to this, I couldn't believe what I was hearing from this guy. Like this is you're calling me a conspiracy theory, and you're sitting here like trying to read body language where you can't even see the person's body. <laughs> it's just it's ridiculous. Okay, let's let's pull it back a little bit. Making that call. This, the sound of workload, is something that I often hear in the simulator. Now look at this bullshit video thing that he does here where he tries to go, look at this increased pitch. Like, this is just arbitrary bullshit that they just made up. <laughs> the, the, the pitch is increased. Dude, people can just say words in different ways. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to take over a plane or whatever bullshit you're trying to imply here. Like, this is extremely disrespectful to the pilots uh, and the families as well. As well as when I'm doing training in the aircraft. And that's why I... Here's a video of me doing training in the cockpit so I can know whether or not uh, somebody's voice inflection is uh, nefarious or not. <laughs> yeah, where did he get his PhD in pitchology? Uh, oh, yeah, he didn't. He didn't get one. And by the way, just to be 100% clear, he's going rogue from the official narrative here now as well. From the official report that he claims that he's following. Making that call. So there you go, guys. We've played it three different times. I listened to it. I didn't hear anything anomalous in either of those communications whatsoever. Certainly no one panicking. Certainly no one having any extra stress going on. Um, to me, that's the worst part about this whole video.
um, just he spends like 15 minutes vilifying these guys over this uh, this communication. Now, I'm not going to dig too much into the technical aspects because that's the part where Mentor Pilot certainly has on me uh, the, the technical aspects. But I will again repeat that the Minister of Defense was asked by the New York Times like the next day, can someone even make a plane go dark? Is that even a thing that someone can do? And they wouldn't answer the question because presumably the answer is no. The only simulation that got close included a manually flown turn, meaning that the autopilot must have been disconnected. So this is part where I agree. So when the plane went dark, the autopilot got disconnected. Totally agree with that. Actually, the new report that just came out says the same thing as well. The reason why they were able to determine this is because the turn, uh, uh, an autopilot turn doesn't make that sharp of a turn. Simple logic. No problem there. Why would you make a sharp turn like that? If you are a suicidal pilot, you're just going to dive down the plane. Boom. Story's over. When you're making a turn like that, that's an emergency turn, which would indicate what? An emergency event. And where do they go, chat? Where does the plane go? It goes directly to Penang, makes a beeline towards the closest airport that can accommodate a 777. And my dog is going hard on that water right now. Um, okay, so let me go ahead and show it. Here you go. So here is our turn. I'm going to fast forward it to our turn up here. Here's our turn. Planes turning around, doing an emergency turn maneuver. And where does it go? Penang International Airport. Direct beeline to the closest airport that you can accommodate 777. Lowers the altitude so that it can have enough oxygen for the passengers to breathe. What does this indicate? This indicates an emergency event. This is 100% contrary to any type of pilot suicide narrative. You could argue it's a hijacking scenario, but if you're a hijacker, why are you going to the closest airport to accommodate a 777? Important stuff. Uh, one thing I do want to mention is this, guys. I hear a lot of stuff from my community and other people about people being assets and people being on the payroll. That's not the case. Joe Rogan is not a CIA asset. Mentor Pilot's not a CIA asset. Um, that's not even how it works anyway. They're more covert than that. The way that they work is they manipulate people to do things so that it seems like it's their choice. Um, so, you know, you'd have a better argument with me of saying that, like, uh, Jeremy Corbell is being manipulated, and that's why he told Joe Rogan that the videos are fake. Now, that's something that the CIA might do. They're doing it more covertly, though. They're not just standing on making somebody an asset the way that you guys would imagine. The situation with Mentor Pilot, my personal opinion of him, is that he's somebody who's a logical, rational guy, like I am, like a lot of us are. And he can't believe in something that is too far beyond the paradigm. Too far. The idea of warping a plane is too far beyond the paradigm. The idea that the United States government would steal an airliner, too far beyond the paradigm for a lot of people. And that's the truth of the challenge that we face when we go over this type of evidence. You know, um, Yes, it's difficult to believe, but again, we don't do anybody any disservice or any um, positive service by ignoring the facts and ignoring the evidence. No matter where it leads, we need to look at it. And this is where I would challenge the people like them and anybody else wants to do investigation on MH370. And this is what I told Ross Colhart as well. Even if you don't think the MH370 videos are real, you must give credit to the fire scenario. You must look at the fire scenario. It's supported by far more evidence than the crash in the South Indian Ocean scenario is. And the moment they do that, they will begin to realize that the MH370 videos are what happened to this plane. Okay, so the next part. Um, so the turn back. Actually makes sense. I agree with there. He misses the fact that Mike McKay sees the plane on fire. He doesn't ever address that in his video. He never addresses uh, Catherine T. He actually never addresses any of the witnesses. None of them at all. Even though you have 19 witnesses that corroborate a fire emergency event that are all lined up on the, the agreed upon flight path of the plane. Catherine T is right at the location where the plane turns in the South Indian Ocean. It's literally impossible for her to have not seen the plane. And yet everybody just ignores her like she never existed. Her sighting is extremely credible. She came out and reported the sighting right after she landed in Phuket. The moment she got off the boat, she reported it. Uh, she was sure that she saw the plane because she did. 
And she, if she was lying, then she was committed to the lie eight years later. Eight years later, she was still talking about why the family's gone silent. The silence is sinister. That was her last post on Twitter. The silence is sinister. That's not somebody who made up a story about a plane, guys. That's somebody who saw some crazy stuff and is trying to reconcile what happened to get truth for the families. Um... Okay, so there is one part in here as Why well. Why is that, you might ask? Well, the autopilot will only allow certain bank angles. Yeah, and so this he pretty much says what I just mentioned there. Um, now, the thing that he says uh, coming up here is a little bit speculative at 1725. Now, here he basically says that whoever turned was trying to avoid radar. Now, this is highly speculative. Just because there's an invisible boundary here where who controls the radar zone, does not mean that the radars are limited to that range. I think that there's no chance that the Taiwanese government did not track MH370, just like we know the Malaysian government tracked them. Um, heck, Joran's radar system, the over-the-horizon Jindali operational network, uh, radar network, probably could have seen the plane from start to finish. So this is where the over-the-horizon radar that sees for thousands of miles... If he was doing due diligence here, he would have looked into the over-the-horizon radar networks. Uh, he would have looked into the Cocoa Islands uh, base that was in the southern Indian Ocean. He would have looked into the Pine Gap base that probably has over-the-horizon radar as well as Diego Garcia. Both of them almost certainly have over-the-horizon radars and can see like most of the way uh, for thousands of miles at least. So the idea that anybody's avoiding radar, nonsensical. That's just not how it works. There's no way to avoid radar. You don't avoid radar by... Uh, uh, avoiding imaginary zones that aren't accurate to the radar range. Entering into that zone and follow it up, unless it was properly identified, had a working transponder, and followed a filed flight plan. By carefully avoiding that zone, whoever was now in control would also avoid any direct scrutiny from the Thai military. And given the direction yeah, the aircraft was now turning, we it's likely that it. anyone looking at the primary radar would assume that the aircraft was just diverting, still under Malaysian control. This turn would also position the aircraft between that Thai ADI Z and Airway Mike 765, which would avoid any opposite traffic. So, okay, a couple comments on this. I think there is a possible logical argument where you can make that whoever was in charge of this plane or remote controlling this plane or whatever the situation was, that they were trying to avoid the official radar zones to stay, you know, for lack of a better term, fly under the radar to be to not be really get, get caught right away they want to make sure that they, they know they're going to get seen anyway but they wanted to make it seem as normal as possible you can make that argument that's not what a suicidal pilot does suicidal pilot doesn't give a shit how many radars sees their plane if you're suicidal you're going to crash the plane anywhere anytime you have no reason or motivation to hide the plane either it doesn't even make sense so there is that side of it but the other side of it is this isn't you can't hide radar like this at all it's you can't hide from radar. It's just not how it works. Um, okay, so then let's go forward a little bit. I don't know where this... ...in that log. And because none of that happened, the most likely reason for this SATCOM loss was a power failure to the system itself. Now... This system can be powered from several different electrical buses and from most of the aircraft. So the electrical buses, and I don't know enough about all of the electrical buses and turning it off. I am not under the impression that a single person from the cockpit can make the whole plane go dark. And I think that's the important aspect here. Um, but, you know, I think there's enough uh, evidence already that shows that there's no way the pilot did this anyway. Um, and the fire event seems to make a lot more sense. I mean, you can definitely make a plane go dark if you have an explosion near the electronics bay and you take out some of the main equipment. The part that I wanted to go into here was when they fly over Penang. Okay, so he goes into this for a while. Oh. Okay, here we go would be quite tiring and that's likely why the radar images were showing these small heading variations anyway at this stage the so yeah so he was manually flying the plane and this is why you see the plane squiggle just a little bit because it's somebody manually flying it you, you know just like you're in your car you're not on a perfect line now this is where it gets to penang where right now how is he not 
wondering how anyone could say this is an espionage scenario. This is the closest airport to land a 777. Aircraft continued to be tracked by both civilian and military raw radar as it continued its way around the south of... Also, there's a base here called Buttersworth, a military base, and there's no chance they wouldn't have tracked the plane. So it's already getting really weird in terms of why people are claiming they have no idea what happened to this plane when you have all these radar, military bases, everything supposedly following it. Nine, where it started turning right through the Malacca Strait. Okay, so he missed something else. Does he mention this? There were temporary lapses in the radar coverage, but all in all, it painted a fairly... Okay. Well, I don't know if he mentions it there. I'm not going to try to dig through it, but he missed the fact that the pilot's cell phone pings a cell tower. Why is this important? In order to ping a cell tower from your cell phone on board an airplane, the plane has to be under 7,000 feet. The plane has to be extremely low. Why is this important? Because it may indicate there was communications that were lost. It may indicate that the pilot or the co-pilot had the plane taken from control from them and they were trying to communicate. It could indicate that their communications were jammed and it would indicate they were flying low enough, A, to give enough oxygen for the passengers to be able to breathe, again, consistent with the fire event, um, as well as flying low enough to get emergency communication because they knew that the cell phones would not ring above 10,000 feet. So to me, that's a pretty big whiff on the evidence there because this is the type of stuff where if you're trying to actually solve the mystery and solve the case, you can't just pick and choose what evidence you like. The thing about MH370 investigation, the reason why our investigation, and I say our because there's many people who are in the chat, some of my admins right now are some major contributors, is that we looked at all the evidence. We did not rule any evidence out that we didn't like unless we found that there was no way that the evidence made any sense and that led to a scenario where we found out that yeah the official story out there's bullshit the cherry picks evidence and throws away tons of evidence that they just don't like because they can't figure out how they can't figure out how it was a fire event um and that's just you know that's a doing a disservice to the families it's doing a disservice to pretty much everybody out there anyone who's trying to find the truth okay um and yeah, again, the SATCOM loss is most likely due to a power loss. And this is the part where it's going to be indicative of a fire event. Now, the SATCOM supposedly turns back on at 17 or 1825. The problem with this is Catherine T sees the plane at 1840 and it's dark, which would indicate there was no power. There's no navigation lights. So if they spoofed the radar, the satellite, they may have started spoofing that at 1825 UTC. The time where the plane was uh, reported as going dark and going missing and being lost communication by Subang Air Traffic Control. You guys can look up on March 8th, 2014. The official reports that very next day said the plane lost contact at 1840 UTC. Why is this important? Because this is the location and time that Catherine T saw the plane. And we think she saw the plane within minutes of the plane disappearing in the videos. To me, that's pretty incredible evidence. Okay. Um, now, the last thing, uh, I'm not going to show all the rest of this. I'm just going to talk about the whisper data. But for like the last 15 minutes, he goes into the whisper data. Link to some incredible investigative work made by Captain Patrick Blelli and Jean Luc. Patrick Blelli. He's Patrick Blelli is exactly that's how you say his name. Blelli. Patrick Blelli is the one who literally just came out yesterday, and they said that this shows that the plane did an emergency descent. So hopefully we'll have an update by mentor pilot here. He can get a you know another paycheck, and maybe this time he'll present the fire scenario accurately. Chand in the description of this video, which. Prove without further physical aircraft. Let's see. Okay, here's the whisper. Now, I want to be absolutely clear here and say that Taylor himself never designed whisper to be used for the tracking of aircraft. Neither did he actually think that it was possible. But back in 2021, an avionics system engineer called Richard Godfrey started exploring the possibility of using the Whisper database together with algorithms to look for anomalies in several different simultaneous transmissions as a kind of poor man's primary radar. Theoretically, if you know the exact location of the transmitter and the receiver, together with the time of day and about a million other factors, 
there might be a possibility to use tiny concurring anomalies in several of these signals to track something like an aircraft. And the really cool thing is that this technology samples thousands of signals every two minutes, which could potentially give us much more information than we previously had. Godfrey understood this, and from 2021 until today, he and his colleagues, Dr. Hannes Coetze and Professor Simon Maskell, have been trying to analyze this database to try and find traces of MH370. And in a report released on the 31st of August 2023, they claim that they have actually done just that. Again, this video is not about whether this technology actually can be used this way or not, but what I find fascinating here is that it's based on verifiable stored data. So just like with DNA that couldn't be used much during the early years, but has since been Trying defined to compare in data to DNA. Maybe okay. they're actually- I've seen enough. Okay, so situation with the whisper data. Why is the whisper data bullshit? I'm probably one of the only people on the planet that read all 70 pages, or sorry, it was 300 pages of the whisper report. Uh, was one of the first things I did way back in September. I stayed up all night reading it, actually. And uh, there's no chance that this stuff works. Um, first of all, the guy that wrote it, like he just said, said it can't be used to track planes. He's on the record saying that. It doesn't work that way. Um, the idea of whisper data is, like he just said, with all these pings everywhere, what they're trying to do is they try to say, they try to match, first of all, with the satellite pings. They use the satellite pings. They use the capabilities of a 777, how fast it can go, its altitude, et cetera. And they try to estimate then based on that, looking at various pings that they find, what the track of the plane was. The problem with this is, this is the analogy I've always given, going all the way back to September, is that whisper data is like being in a crowd of people. And you're trying to find the person who's with you that has a white shirt on, and they get lost in the crowd, and everybody in the crowd has a white shirt on. How many, how are you going to find the person with the white shirt on that is your person versus all the other people that are out there? There's nothing different differentiating any of these pings. And so what the whisper analysis did incorrectly was they used a co confirmation bias is that a, they assumed that the satellite pings were correct, where there's almost no chance that they are after 1840 UTC. And then they tried to find pings that made sense and, and draw a route. It's like, if you're playing connect the dots, but you've got way too many dots, so you just pick the dots you like to draw the route that you want. Now, you may say, okay, Ash, and that's being kind of unfair. Um, but it's really not. In fact, I could be way more unfair. I mean, if you watch any of the in-person interviews with Richard Godfrey, it's clear this guy is not an expert in anything. He's somebody who's probably passionate about solving the case, which I appreciate. I am too. But he's somebody who is very stuck in his own bias about this whisper route analysis must be the answer. And it just simply doesn't lead there. So the biggest issues with the whisper route in terms of the whisper report, which again, I read. First problem is that once you get past Penang, it already stops making sense. First of all, I think that he has in the altitude that they assume a high altitude. But as we've seen from the cell phone ping and the emergency descent and the people who were on the boat, this plane wasn't flying high. It was flying low. Um, after it gets past Penang, he has this plane going in a slightly different route where it hugs the coast of Indonesia. First problem is that if it went the route that he says, it would have crossed over with UAE 343, which is United Emirates uh, Airlines Flight 343, would have crossed directly over its path, which means that UAE 343 would have seen MH370. Now, they went and did interviews with the pilots of UAE 343, and they did not see the plane. It's practically impossible they wouldn't have seen a rogue 777, maybe if the navigation lights were off. But this is already implausible number one thing that happened. I remember trying to figure out maybe that they had been covered up or something like that. But it wasn't until later on when I realized the whisper route data was just incorrect. And the route that he had it going didn't make any sense. So then he has the plane go to Indonesia and hug along the coast of Indonesia. And the argument here is that they were avoiding radar. Again, this is not how you avoid radar. Planes don't fly along the coast like a human being would run along the coast on the beach. That's not how planes operate. A suicidal pilot's going to fly directly over the route of the of the peninsula. And anybody else who's going somewhere else is not doing it to avoid radar. Radar extends beyond the coast. So this was the second mistake that was made with respect to the analysis in the whispered out report. Now, the third mistake that was made was when the plane goes to our point where it turns and then turns in the South Indian Ocean around Indonesia. 
The Whisper Report has it doing a cutback. And it's fine that you have the plane doing a cutback. The weird part is when you read the top of the Whisper Report, in the top of the Whisper Report, it says the plane does a cutback as if someone to see if anyone was following the plane. This is the part where, hey, wait, didn't you just say you were just looking at ham radio signals? There's no way that you can infer information about checking to see if someone's behind the plane. This is the part where you are now creating a, a, no, a telenovela in your head and you're adding your own story to the, to the incident that there's no evidence that supports. So this is the part where I started getting really suspicious. And when I first saw that, I went, whoa, this was a spy thing. Someone was tracking the plane. He was checking it out. And then when you find out Whisper Dad, it doesn't work that way at all. You realize, oh, he was just making up complete nonsense. And the real killer is the part where it's obvious that Richard Godfrey could not find any pings to keep the route going. So what did he do? He built in a 22 minute long holding pattern. Yes. In the, in the Indian Ocean, just randomly. Oh, I'm just going to go into a holding pattern for 22 minutes and fly around in circle. Now, why did he do that? Because there were no pings that had a continuous flight path for what he was trying to accommodate. Um, and that's the killer to the whisper route data that shows conclusively the whisper route data is nonsense. Nobody who's either hijacking the plane or a suicidal pilot is going to be, uh, you know, flying around in circles. There was also a lot of the pings showed the plane doing direct routes directly at various airports. And early on, I thought, oh, well, this is because it's the person's panicking and they're trying to land the plane. But you would have landed the plane at any one of the other airports if that was the situation. The rationale here was he was just using faulty ham pings that weren't really the plane. And he was tying them to the plane when they have no indication of being tied to the plane. So, um that, that's the the real rub regarding the whisper. Oh, and then I guess the final thing is that Richard Godfrey claims that his whisper analysis knows exactly where the plane crashed and it didn't crash there. They already checked. There's nothing there. Uh, so these are probably the 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 whole things. Yeah, just for the for the judgmental lizard here. Yeah, he literally made up a holding pattern where the plane just flies around in a circle for 22 minutes because he couldn't find any pings that kept it going. Um, you guys can go look for yourself. If you don't believe me. Again, I read the whole thing. Uh, whisper analysis is complete nonsense. Um, and, you know, this is the reason why the officials have not taken w Richard Godfrey's analysis and, and done a new search, despite the fact that he says he knows exactly where the plane crashed, because they know it's nonsense as well. They know that they're not going to find the plane there. And so just to close that part out before we go to my video on Redacted, I am 100% in support of an additional search. I think if they don't search given how many people claim to know exactly where the plane crashed or that the plane really just sank perfectly intact between these two crevices and this one spot where we somehow didn't check underneath the water. Uh, based on all of these supposed experts that all claim to know where the plane is and the guy that also says that he pulled up a part of the wing on his tiny little boat and that he knows exactly where the thing is, if they're not searching after all this, what does that tell you? It tells you they know they're not going to find the plane. It tells you they know the plane didn't crash down there and they know it's a waste of money and waste of resources. They already spent nearly 200 million or more dollars searching for the plane. And the Malaysian government would have been in the know from the beginning. They would have been told by the United States government what really happened and why they're never going to find it there. And then the whole search was just a big show. So uh, again, I hope they search because if they do search, they won't find the plane. And the more times they search and find nothing, the more people realize the satellite pings going to the South Indian Ocean are nonsense. They're obviously nonsense, but um, it's going to take some people longer than others to figure that out. Now, let's take a look at some clips from the Redacted podcast. So now I just want to compare. I want you guys at home to compare the Whisper report that I just talked about Uh mentor pilots um video and how he presents information which it doesn't do the worst job presenting it but watch how i present the information on the redacted podcast because when i present information i am trying to get out as much evidence as possible and i think about how much time i have and i just try to present the evidence because i know that you guys time is valuable and i know that the people that are out there they don't want to hear stories they don't want to hear unsubstantiated information. They want to hear the hard evidence so that they can come up with their own determination of what they think happened. And that's why I think that this interview I did with Clayton, 
Uh, Clayton Morris on Redacted was so good. Uh, I watched it all myself earlier today, and even I was impressed with uh, the amount of information and the con how much I was able to condense into an only an hour and 20 minutes. What if really happened this, to Malaysian Airlines flight MH370? You should definitely check it out. I'm not going to watch the whole thing here. I don't want to do the whole thing here tonight with us. Uh, I do want to sleep, but I do have some specific parts that we're going to go into. We're going to start with the pilot suicide myth. And actually, I think I saw a good question there real quick. Is there something like a MD5 checksum on the video? Uh, people have asked about that. You know what? It's been a long time since people asked about that. I don't think so, but I'm not sure. Maybe. Maybe. Plane took and it doesn't. Um, it's just somewhat similar as it goes over the Andaman Sea. Oh, okay. So, uh, so there's some uh, pieces of the plane in Africa. And uh, this narrative, after he posted it out there, got legs. People started running with it. This is a suicide um, pilot narrative. But I don't think people realize that everybody has ruled that out. The officials have ruled that out. The wife supported him. The coworkers supported him. People think that there was this simulator data that was found. FBI has ruled that out. Uh, experts that actually I don't even agree with in general have ruled out the simulator data. It turns out that that was just MH150 from Kuala Lumpur to Jeddah. And he was actually scheduled to fly that route the next day. And they've gone ahead and tried to, you know, the narratives out there have tried to say that this somehow matches the route that the plane took and it doesn't. Um, it's just somewhat similar as it goes over the Andaman Sea. Uh, and so there's a lot of misinformation out there that people have absorbed and, and kind of had now built into this narrative of this pilot suicide. But if you look at the flight path, there's no indication of suicide whatsoever. Like if you are suicidal, you just crash the plane. You don't turn the plane around when it goes dark. You don't fly to the nearest airport that you could go to to land a 777. You don't try to avoid radar flying around Indonesia. If you're suicidal, you don't care about any of these things. Um, it's pretty clearly an emergency event situation, just given the flight path alone. Maybe we just... Oh, there we go. Right there. Um, I mean, that, that pretty much just puts a nail in the coffin of the suicidal pilot. The, the simulator data is not a pre-planned route. It was ruled out by the, the, the FBI. Um, it's not even a match to the route. <laughs> That's the funniest part. Um, it's uh, it's basically the equivalent of the people that said the Pyromania VFX matches when it just doesn't match. Like there's only one part of the route that's somewhat similar. And people are like, well, that's good enough. That's all we needed. <laughs> uh, when you're vilifying a pilot, when you're trying to come up with evidence for it, um, you know, you need to come up with more than that. And the biggest thing is that we never found the plane in the South Indian Ocean. Right? So if those pings were correct, then where's the plane? Um, now, high science is the next clip that we're going to get to here. Around 13 minutes in. Traveling together. Do you have you piece that or is it still speculation at this point? Yeah, I think the narrative that makes the most sense, given the totality of the evidence at this point, is, as I mentioned, one of espionage. Um, that, And I think that we couldn't have figured this out w without the videos, um, because what we see happening here is potentially that we have people defecting to China with intellectual property from the American company. Perhaps China had some leverage over the eight uh, free-scale semiconductor employees that were Chinese nationals. If you look into free uh, to semiconductors in general, uh, you will find that the stocks of semiconductors have skyrocketed, especially over the last few years. I mean, just look at NVIDIA over the last six months. Um, right. So one big aspect of the MH370 videos is the idea of superconductivity, room temperature superconductivity. In my mind, this is the uh, fundamental requirement in order for us to achieve anti-gravity and additional advanced technology that we would consider as high science. I think that we've had it figured out for potentially decades. And this company, like Freescale Semiconductors, I think you could call Freescale Superconductors. And if this, if they had some component, like those microchips that was just mentioned, that could allow for magical technology that is essentially a, a super weapon capability type of technology that allows you for absolute military supremacy of the planet, then the narrative here that makes the most sense is the United States government is preventing China from getting access to this technology. Because whoever controls and, this controls the world. And the idea is that these individuals were working for an American company that were somehow defecting, bringing this information to China? That's, I think, the, as hard as it is to believe, that makes the most sense. And if you go back to what we talked about right away, 
in terms of the weird obfuscation that happened right away about yeah so anyone who's ignoring the 20 free scale semiconductor scientists on board this plane really odd i mean if you need a hijacking scenario this is not a lone pilot that would have pulled this off this requires much more coordination it's a very sophisticated hijacking if so and you, then immediately these 20 free scale semiconductor scientists stick out like a sore thumb um what happened with this plane and why it seems like a cover story was being developed at that point and one of the strongest narratives was this idea of a hijacking scenario but you're old enough and maybe a lot of the audience are old enough to remember 9 11 in terms of this idea that they had a very low tech uh hijack where uh, people stole those planes and crashed them uh what have you this seemed much more complicated uh in terms of the flight path it was there was they didn't crash into any buildings that we could find um it was very it's very difficult to make a plane disappear and go dark but if it's a state actor pulling it off then it actually it becomes much more plausible even though it seems more like something out of a movie um but i think that the united states government china and potentially even russia might have this type of um uh, uh might be able to have this type of capabilities okay so um yeah, if anyone thinks you can avoid radar, you can't. Um, there's nothing to FOIA related to the passengers. I've FOIA'd everybody around MH370. I've gotten essentially nothing back. I've FOIA'd every single department pretty much uh, around it. And what was the other things? Have the Iranians been profiled? Not really. That's the thing. This interview here is the Redacted podcast. You can find many links to it uh, on my Twitter profile or you can go to Redacted on their YouTube channel. Please check it out um you know we've got mentor pilots videos 3.7 million views this one only has somewhere between 350,000. we need to get that bad boy up to over a million so that people can begin to learn real truth as you can tell i'm presenting factual information and i'm weaving in my opinions as necessary so that people can understand the story but the point on this interview is to get as much information in the hour and 20 minutes as possible for people now, the espionage event starts here around 1800. I think you guys will find this pretty compelling in the forward cargo bay right next to the electronics bay. Uh, and it, then it, for whatever reason, it doesn't land there. It turns and goes into the Straits of Malacca. Now it deviates its, its direction a little bit, heads towards the Nicobar Islands. Now, the official or the news reports the next day or the same morning when the plane disappeared said that this plane lost contact with Subang air traffic control at 1840 UTC. They later changed this to say that the military was tracking it until about 815 or 1815 or 1822 UTC, um, not quite at the location where they then later argued that the plane turned into the South Indian Ocean. Now, interestingly enough, at 1840 UTC, this is the time in the Nicobar Islands where they claim this plane made a sharp turn in the South Indian Ocean and then just flew for like five hours straight until it supposedly crashed down there somewhere. This is also the location of the Nicobar Islands around 1840 UTC that we've pinpointed the location of the MH370 videos happening. And there's even a witness there named Catherine T who saw a glowing orange plane at low altitude descending with smoke coming out of the back of it. And we were able to determine from this that the glowing orange uh, plane was because of uh, bromine, which is a halogen gas from a chemical reaction of the Halon 1301 fire extinguishing devices that would have been permeating throughout the plane, putting out the, the fire in the cargo bay for a little bit over an hour. This is also corrupt. So, yeah, the Catherine T sighting is, I can't believe people <laughs> ignore that. Like, so important. And it happens the same time the videos happen and in the same coordinates generally where the videos are happening. Uh, blows my mind that people just completely ignored her and ignored her sighting that was out there. Uh, let's skip ahead to 20. Oh, yeah. Here we go. There's actually coordinates in the MH370 satellite video. In the bottom left, you can see that it says NROL 22, which is the first National Reconnaissance Office launch of the super coordinates system chat. in 2006. The coordinates change when the perspective of the video changes. And this tells us a couple things. It tells us that we're not looking directly through a satellite. Because if we're looking through a satellite and the satellite's moving, those coordinates would be moving in real time as well but they only move when the person moves the video screen around. Now, this is going to be consistent with if you were using like some type of Google Maps, Google Earth type situation. We were able to map that out and graph it out. And uh, I initially had assumed that maybe there was a minus sign in front of it, in which case it would have put it in the South Indian Ocean. 
But when we graphed it out, we found that if it was in the South Indian Ocean, the plane would have been going north into the east. And that was impossible because in both videos, the plane is turning left. And if you're going north into the east, you'd be turning right. So we were able to determine that this coordinates, the plane must be moving, flying south into the east in the videos, and the location must be the Nicobar Islands at the same location where Catherine T. saw the plane. Hmm. I mean, ka I mean, kaboom, chat. Kaboom. I'm going to make another post later tonight because the satellite information and the coordinates and then lining up with the real location of the video, it's undeniable. It's so much evidence that it's ridiculous. Like somebody, what? They decided to add coordinates in their fake video before the raw telemetry data was even made available. The raw telemetry data wasn't available till May 28th, but the video was published on May 19th. So they just guessed at a random location that ended up being the real location where the plane turned into the South Indian Ocean. Even why would they even add that? The moment that that was that information was wrong, the whole videos would have been proven to be fake. It makes no sense. And the coordinates are accurate to dis six decimal places. When I say they're accurate to six decimal places, I mean when the perspective moves, it's accurate to somebody moving the location on a, a coordinate map on a two D coordinate map. They didn't just put random numbers in there. It's like actually a real overlay of a real coordinate system. So they what built in? A, they built another software computer program coordinate system, and then they perfectly overlaid it with the shifts in their fake hoax video. And what this was a random board, some somebody board who was trolling on the internet. If these videos are fake, they are faked by a state sponsored actor. They're far far too sophisticated and faked by some bored Bitcoin billionaires like Tim Poole would say. So I, the part of this is like debunkers can't even address this. I think I, the most recent debunk attempt of this I've seen is that they think that they just guessed at the location based on the last radar location, which was three or 400 miles away. <laughs> what? <laughs> Come on, man. This is where people just got to get real. Um, so now if we have that location where we last saw the plane, do we have any debris that was recovered, that's been authenticated, that this may have crashed near the Nicobar Islands? Yeah, so there is the best debris that would argue for the Nicobar Islands location is actually a B777 fire suppression device that washes up in the Maldives that has looks like a little bomb. But if you look at it and compare it to the fire suppression devices in a B777, it's exactly the same. It's a circular metal device with tubes coming out of it. And the only way it could have washed up in the Maldives is if it was empty. Guys, first of all, Clayton's producer did an amazing job adding the videos. I don't know if you guys realize this, but I was not looking at the videos when we did this interview. I was actually doing that all from memory when we talk about the videos. And I talk about them several times on here. He superimposed the videos into the interview afterwards. I sent him all the information. He superimposed the B77 fire suppression device. All that stuff got superimposed into the videos afterwards. He did a great, great job. It gives you such good visual cue for it. How is the B777 fire suppression device not a, just a complete smoking gun? Of course it was a fire event. It's corroborated by 90 witnesses. A B777 fire suppression device washes up in the Maldives like a week and a half later. P they literally reported on it as a bomb. They reported on it as a bomb, even though it's a B777 fire suppression device. Why? Because they couldn't admit the truth. <laughs> Obviously, that's from the plane. There's a serial number on it. <laughs> what the hell? It could only have washed up because it was empty. Was it from some other B777? <laughs> come on guys it's crazy if it was full it would have sank uh and this was reported on as a bomb and the malaysian minister of defense went ahead and just ignored it okay, we're gonna skip ahead i don't want to be up all night royce engine showed up in south africa here we go the debris they did some modeling which if you have lived through covid you know that modeling is complete nonsense um, and the first model they did of the debris drift analysis didn't put the debris anywhere near Africa. And so then they did a new one. And then they said, oh, OK, yeah, now this can explain how the flap around could get there. But nothing can describe explain how a piece of engine cowling from a Rolls Royce engine showed up in South Africa 
um, this debris should have washed up in Australia. They have the plane supposedly based on these satellite pings that they've used. Most of the experts believe these satellite pings are accurate and that we know where the plane uh, crashed. But we searched everywhere above and below water along the seventh arc and found nothing, not one piece of debris. If that location was correct, there should have been debris washing up in Australia. And it can't possibly explain how this supposed debris washed up in Africa. So, uh, And real quick, because I, I like to address people in the chat here. We've got Blue Wave that says a French reporter walked into Airbus 777. Okay, so first of all, you have the wrong craft. Airbus is not the same as Boeing. They're two different companies. And yes, that is a 100% perfect match to a B777 fire suppression device. I'm not going to argue the point. I've done multiple posts on it on my Twitter. You can see for yourself. It is a 100% perfect match. That's a B77 fire suppression device. B777 fire suppression device. The fact that you even mentioned Airbus tells me you don't have any idea what you're talking about. Airbus and Boeing are two completely different companies. So again, please stop believing fake stuff that you see on French news or TV or whatever. Um, believe what your eyes show you. Believe reality. That's my uh, response to that person. Then I think we can clearly say we have no evidence that it crashed. Is that safe to say? I think that you could argue that there's not enough debris to prove that the plane crashed. We also found another plane that was purchased by GA Telesis in October of 2013. It's essentially an exact replica of the plane. Okay, so here's a good question too. So the people ask, so, and this is kind of goes on with just Clayton just asked. So we have no evidence that the plane crashed. I wouldn't say that. I think that the debris that was found was from MH370. And just because a plane gets warped somewhere doesn't mean it went to another dimension. It doesn't mean it went to another galaxy. It doesn't mean it went to the moon. The plane can simply go somewhere else on Earth. This is one thing that I, I don't know why people struggle with this idea so much. They think that if the plane got warped somewhere, it's gone permanently or that it went somewhere else super far away. If there's a fourth orb and you have to warp this fourth orb somewhere, for, warp this plane somewhere, then this fourth orb has to be somewhere as well that you can send it. Can we send an orb all the way off to the Andromeda galaxy? Can we send it to the fourth dimension or fifth dimension? Can we send it to the moon? Theoretically, the simpler answer is they just warped it somewhere else on Earth. If you warp it somewhere else on Earth as well, you don't have a big time dilation effect. The time dilation effect is going to be based on how far the object travels. So it's very possible that this object did not travel that far. And the debris that they find is much more consistent with a crash somewhere around the Maldives or Diego Garcia. Or, as I proposed, that the plane landed in Diego Garcia. But with the fire events, the plane might have had some structural integrity issues. There might have been holes in the plane. The plane might have been depressurized because of an explosion due to the fire, but didn't just didn't blow up. And in that scenario, you can have debris that fell off the plane. Hell, guys, look at the Southwest plane had its engine rip off. The engine calling ripped off a Southwest jet last week while it was taking, excuse me, while it was taking off and it wasn't on fire or anything. We had a door fly off a, B a, a Boeing plane just like two or three weeks ago. Door flew off in the middle of its flight on takeoff. So to me, the tiny amounts of debris are 100% consistent with the fire event alone. And I think that there is some possibility that it crashed. If so, it, just, it didn't crash in the South Indian Ocean. It crashed somewhere completely differently. My opinion, though, is that it landed somewhere. Because if you're going to warp a plane, why are you warping it just to have it crash anyway? doesn't make any sense but i can't claim to know stuff that i don't know uh, for sure and this is the difference between me and some of these other experts that you'll see is that a lot of the experts out there say i know exactly what happened to the plane i could tell because i looked at one flapper on and i was able to deduce that the the flaps were down and therefore this was a pilot suicide who tried to perfectly land the plane blah 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 like these people don't know that they're just making that up I'm not going to tell you stuff that I don't know. I'm going to tell you what the evidence says, and I'm going to give you my opinion on what that evidence means. But that's a good question. That was scrapped 10 years or more too early, and that the flapper on was actually not connected with the unique serial number. The unique serial plate was actually missing off of the flapper on. 
So instead, they broke apart the flap round and looked for part numbers, and they found a partial part serial number match. Now, I would argue that if you've got replicas of the plane out there also purchased from Malaysian Airlines, then those part numbers could be from another plane. However, the scenario that we've presented with this high technology and MH370 videos is the idea that this plane had some type of superluminal event happen. Star Trek warp drive, if you want to think of it as that. So that this plane moves from the Nicobar Islands somewhere over near the Maldives. And then at that point flies south towards Diego Garcia. And this would actually, from the drift analysis models, uh, be a better, more accurate representation of where this debris got into the water and then to wash up over there. Uh, yeah, so, uh, and just to try to go through this a little bit faster, I don't think we have any witnesses that say they saw debris coming off of it, but there may be two additional uh, witnesses that were on the east coast of Malaysia that I haven't incorporated yet into this. Our, our number of witnesses may go up to like 21. The problem with some of the other witnesses is that the direction of travel seems a little bit unreliable in terms of where they think the, the, the plane went, but they, they probably saw it. It's hard to say. Um, so... That's the debris. Again, I, I'm not going to go back and forth with the B777 fire suppression device. Literally just Google the images of the B777 fire suppression device. You can see there's a serial number on the one that they found. And you can see that that's an exact match to what B777 fire suppression device looks like. Um, it's it, no coincidence that this thing washed up in the Maldives uh, just a week and a half later. Okay, uh, 26 minutes, the debunk. So I address the debunks here close to matching even a single frame from the drone video that we see and stock what's a stock effect, effect for yeah what is yeah. a stock effect for our audience stock effects are when you are doing visual effects and you want to save yourself some time from having to produce something from scratch you use a stock effect and you insert it into your uh video creation for example this was done in the killing time video game which where the stock effect was put in exactly as it is uh this was used in an attack on titan anime commercial and it was also used in the movie Starship Troopers. And in none of those did they manipulate the stock effect in any way. And also, it was also found in Eastbound and Down, like yesterday as well. So we have four incidents where the Pyromania VFX was used in major productions. Um, and not in a single one of them did they modify it in any way similar to what is being claimed by debunkers in the MH370 videos. Not one instance. In fact, I've challenged the debunkers to bring up even a single instance where the pyromania VFX was had all its pixels moved around and changed color and changed shape and everything that they've claimed. And they've produced no, none at all. Uh, regarding the person who asked if they, can the fire suppression device be linked to MH370? It probably could have been. There's a visible serial number on it. They used a part number to match a flapper on to the plane. Uh, you would think that they'd be able to use the visible serial number on the B777 fire suppression device to match it to MH370. For some reason, they didn't do that and they dismissed it out of hand. Um, let me see if I can find it real quick. I mean, I could just scroll back, but I think I can find it here quickly. Oh, I don't have the image. Oh, yeah, here it is. Here it is. Okay, so. Go. Let me share this. And again, you guys can Google this stuff for yourself. You don't have to believe anything I'm saying. But this is obviously a B777 fire suppression device. There's no question. That's what this device is. You're looking at it. That's it right there. That's your B777 fire suppression device. This Maldives Finest is a good uh, website. You can see, look, you can see the serial number. Wait, is that not sharing? Hold on. Here we go. There you go. You can literally see the fire, the, the serial number on the top of this bottle right here. You can literally just see it right there. They could have used this to match it to the plane. They instead reported on it as a bomb. It's obviously not a bomb. So anyway, uh, stop screen. Um, and in supposedly in these videos, the people, the debunkers have claimed that they have manipulated the color, reshaped it, resized it, adjusted various contrasts, et cetera. And uh, that to me doesn't make any sense regarding how visual effects works. 
So there you go. You saw the two different um, clips. So just to show that again real quick. Example, this was done in the Killing Time video game, which where the stock effect was put in exactly as it is. Uh, this was used in an Attack on Titan anime commercial, and it was also used in the movie Starship Troopers. And in none of those did they manipulate the stock effect in any way. Uh, you know what? I'm just going to show it on my computer instead of showing it on the thing here. It's easier. I just have it. I mean, I sent them all these uh, anyway. So here is the comparison. Okay, so this is a perfect overlay of the asset to the video. So the what you see here with the color on it is the actual asset. What you see in black is the actual video. So you can see in the middle here, it doesn't match at all. All this black in the background is where it doesn't match. You can even see the part where the plane is sticking out. That doesn't match the internal part here. And then on the edge, I agree they were able to resize and find a blast, uh, circular blast zone that is somewhat similar but it doesn't actually match. It doesn't perfectly line up. There's actually a number of these dots that aren't in our zap at all. So you would have to airbrush all these out. You would have to clean up the edges, completely change the middle. And this is the only frame that's even similar. The rest of the frames on this asset, as you see here, are not even close. The black that you see in the background is the actual zap. What you see here in the foreground with all this zap coming out of it's the asset that they claim was used. This asset was conclusively, definitively, factually not used in the MH370 videos. There's no evidence that it was whatsoever. This is not the same thing that's in our videos. I'm going to show it one more time uh, because a lot of people, for some reason, are stuck on this idea that they think there's video game effects in here. That is not in our video. So... Um, and again, that comes from a guy named Mick West. He deserves all the scorn for pushing that fake debunk. He's the one who found it. He's the one that took credit for it on the same exact day that an anonymous one day old account claims to have found it on Reddit. Corridor crew did not come up with that. That was not their idea. Corridor crew found that from Mick West on Metabunk. The corridor crew are not original thinkers. They're probably not even VFX artists. They're just literal frauds who steal other people's content and pretend like it's their own. That's exactly what they did on the Danny Jones podcast. That's exactly what they did when they made their debunk video. I'm saying that as a factual statement. They didn't take that information or come up with it on their own. They literally took Mick West's and played it off like it was their own. That's called being a fraud, especially when you're wrong as well, like they were. And the funny part is on the, on the Danny Jones podcast, I knew everything they were saying was factually incorrect. And even after I showed that it was factually incorrect, and even after I said that that effect is factually not in our videos, Danny Jones looked me in the eye and said, but they're experts. You have to believe them. Danny Jones is a fucking moron. You hear me? I'm going to say it again. Danny Jones is a fucking moron. <laughs> I, it makes me wonder if he has to have help tying his shoes together in the morning. It's just, it's embarrassing that someone would say, yes, they were wrong about everything, but you should believe them. They're VFX experts. They play one on TV. They're idiots. Nico and the Jordy LaForge guy, they're morons. And I really hope that people aren't getting their factual information from dumbasses that sit on a couch that have no idea what they're talking about, that are factually incorrect about everything they say that splice in cartoons into their reaction videos. It's not how adults act. Okay. Now that we've addressed that, and for the people that are like, Ashton, why are you being harsh on Danny Jones and on the Cordo crew? Well, they deserve it, for one. And no, I'm never going to stop letting up on them, not till the end of the earth. Okay, so... If you're a podcaster and you try to have somebody on and you try to debunk them and attack them, you deserve to be ridiculed for the rest of your career. And I'm going to ridicule them for the rest of both of their careers. And when the videos are proven to be true, I'm going to ridicule them even harder. <laughs> Get ready. Okay, next thing. Uh, 32 minutes in video explanation. And then supposedly in these Oh, and this is the best part right here. Where was that? Right there. So people have argued that this cloud picture uh, has the clouds in it that match the satellite video and that this proves that it must be fake in general. 
Now, the problem with this is that even before that cloud picture showed up, we already proved that the clouds were moving and evolving. Each frame of reference in the Sally video is only a few seconds long. So the clouds aren't moving significantly, but they're moving a little bit. They kind of evolve. You can see the edges kind of grow or, or shorten. We can see the first orb puncture a hole through one of the clouds. But the most important aspect that rules out a cloud picture is that when the zap happens in the satellite video, it actually accurately illuminates the clouds in three dimensions in the foreground and in the background. For this type of accurate illumination, you would have to build a full 3D rendered environment. You cannot use a 2D visual effect for that. So whether or not I, I there you go, guys. So whether or not you think there's a satellite picture or a 2D uh, cloud picture in here doesn't really matter because you can't use you can't make th accurate 3D lighting using a 2D picture. As you saw in that clip right there, the clouds match in two different videos from two different perspectives, which proves that you would need a full 3D rendered environment to get that to happen. Nobody who's come even remotely close. The people have tried to recreate the videos. Nobody's tried to recreate a 3D model environment from two different two different shots because they know they can't recreate these videos. So people, anyone who's claiming they've recreated the videos is lying to you. They have not. Both recreations that I've seen have been terrible. Um, the cloud picture one literally copied every aspect that it could from the videos. And it still is, you can tell that it's fake within five seconds because the plane doesn't even match. And that's because the uh, asset that they claim they found for the B7777 doesn't match our videos because when you look at a real video, it's not a stock effect. It's not stock assets that are being used. It's an actual real video in real life. It's like trying to claim use a stick man for me and going, well, that video can't be fake. The stick man stock effect that I use for Ashton doesn't match. Yeah, it's because I'm a real person, not a stock effect. Um, and then the best part too, and I didn't even mention the fact that there was um, some of the the... Debris that was found had burn marks on them. So if you don't if you don't believe me, does again it doesn't matter if you believe me because I have the hard evidence. So there is your burn mark that has clear heat damage on it. It's got scorch marks all over this thing. So some of the debris that, and this has the honeycomb pattern of a Boeing airplane as well. Even though we don't have serial number to match this to the plane, so they actually even found debris that actually has burn marks on it. <laughs> like the amount of evidence that people had to ignore in order to think that these videos are fake is crazy. And if you don't think that somebody would fabricate fake evidence to dismiss this case, you are, have not been paying attention. I've had many scammers and hoaxers try to fabricate fake evidence to debunk the videos. That's how mentally unwell people are in, in this world in general is that people will literally fabricate fake evidence in order to try to convince people that they they have no reason to try to debunk these videos. They literally just need to have their minds be at ease. This picture here proves that we're not looking at a 2D cloud picture in, in the satellite video. You can see accurate 3D lighting here. This requires a full 3D rendered environment to get the, the light point correction. Uh, correct here otherwise we would not see correct lighting on this cloud here on the left on these clouds near at the bottom you see how they're even darker down here this is accurate three-dimensional lighting you can't do this in a 2d picture nobody randomly went to all this effort to make this stuff there's no hoaxer of these videos okay Whew. guys i haven't done mh370 streams like this in a while um, the only reason why I'm doing this, by the way, is people wonder, well, hey, Ashton, haven't you uh, retired from the case? Technically, but now the moment I retired, everybody wants to talk about it again. I've got people making videos. I've got huge podcasters like Clayton Morris or Redacted wanting to talk to me. I've got another big appearance coming up next week as well um, that I haven't really talked too much about. I don't, I'm not going to be announcing my big appearances uh, beforehand. It's not Joe Rogan or anything that huge, but it's a big a big uh big, big platform um so and then we new articles have come up as well like the new article that we saw just yesterday regarding the emergency descent came up yes i'm of course i'm going to talk about that kind of stuff so anytime anyone comes at me anytime anyone makes these videos about the case or about me i am gonna discuss them and that's what we're doing here although we haven't done any new hardcore investigation related to this. I'm mostly just focused on the science and understanding the science of macroscopic phase conjugation and how we can warp a plane, which apparently we can do because we're seeing it in two videos. Uh, let's see here. 
Okay, so now we've dealt with the fire suppression device bottle. Let's go back to the video real quick. Just presenting the evidence for people that can come up with their own opinions on it. And then okay. later as well, I'll present the strongest evidence for why the videos are We've got a few more things to do. Okay, right, um, the video explanation. That... They got the wrong this picture here. This is a software setting in the Raytheon cameras that is available. And this may be the default settings as opposed to the black and white that we've seen from the DOD Navy videos that were declassified in 2017. Now we're watching a Boeing 777-200 that's an exact overlay of Malaysian Airlines Flight 370, which indicates that we are actually looking at Malaysian Airlines in the video. And we see it making a hard left turn. We see it descending in the videos. We can tell that we are looking at cumulus clouds. Uh, these cumulus clouds only form at low altitudes. We check the weather pattern for that day. And within 15 minutes of when we think these videos happen, the weather actually had low altitude cumulus clouds in the Nicobar Islands. Main chat. There's our low altitude cumulus clouds at our coordinates within 15 minutes of when we think the videos happen. Um, one quick point I want to bring up. This is a good question that was brought up in the chat. Can the teleportation tech move children from one place to another? This technology absolutely seems like magic. It does. But I think that still the technology that we're looking at in these videos is the most rudimentary form of teleportation or warp drive, if you want to call it that. I'm going to call it warp, um, which means I think there's still limitations. I think that having a large object like they, they had is probably easier than trying to teleport an individual person that's on the ground. I think that the object might have to be in the air. Uh, I think that in the future... If this technology advances, then you could get to a point where you could actually have like a like a warp gate where you just walk through and then you're somewhere else. But I think that that technology is the crazy part about it is just because you understand warp technology, or you've discovered warp technology does not mean that you have unlimited access. There's still much further to go in terms of advancing that technology, which is why I think that people shouldn't think of this as technology that is impossible. They should think of it. This is the starting point for the technology. And it's just going to get crazier from there. But to that point, the, yeah, there are some pretty dark aspects. If you watch the end of this interview, you'll you'll hear those well, aspects that we talk about them a lot. Uh, the plane is actually maxing out the capabilities of Duck 777-200 wall yeah. and descent, wall turning at roughly 150 to 250 miles per hour. This would be very difficult to uh, fake. In fact, there was somebody who posted on social media claiming to be a VFX artist from the movie Top Gun Maverick that said that scaling down planes like this and, and getting it to be accurate to the capabilities of the plane is some of the hardest things to pull off. Now, what we see, both videos actually are in perfect synchronization. We have a satellite video looking from one angle, and then we have a drone video looking horizontally from a completely different angle from the opposite side. I mean, you can see the clouds match. In the drone video, we can see these orbs begin to circle around the plane. In the satellite video, we see these orbs coming in at roughly 2,000 miles per hour, Mach 2, Mach 3 speeds. We've estimated based on comparing pixels in them. And in both videos, these orbs are defying gravity as we know it. They're... Okay, I'm not going to go through the whole thing here. You guys have probably watched me talk about the videos a million times. You can watch the whole thing for yourself as well. I want to go to the sketchy data at 40 minutes. They did a good job. No sense. The they argued that the ACAR system was turned off at 1707 UTC, which is 13 minutes before the plane went dark. But then we have full data from 1707 all the way up to 1840 UTC. And then at 1840 UTC, which the next ping is 1941 UTC through 2313 UTC, again, about five hours, we just have 10 rows of data. And there's a pattern in that data. And they try to argue that something changed, but I can't figure out what that might be in terms of why there would be this difference here. In my mind, if the system was turned off at 1707, the discrepancies should begin at 1707. They shouldn't begin at 1840 UTC. We looked into the SATCOMs. All of the SATCOM systems that exist out there all have zero day vulnerabilities and exploits. They're all easily hackable. In fact, you probably only have to change one value in these systems in order to get people to believe that a plane went in a different direction than it actually did. For example, to convince people that it went south instead of going to the west. But the strongest evidence why those pings are not true is that we found nothing in the location where those pings supposedly say that the plane went into the South Indian Ocean. We didn't find one piece of debris. So here, guys, when you're looking at the screen here, this is your evidence for... These pings just don't make any sense. 
The pings are great. Now look at the times here on the left. You'll notice it says 1840 after 1840, then it's 1941, 2041, All of a sudden, all the data is gone. All of a sudden, it's just every hour there's a ping. And you look at it, look at this. There's a pattern 10 4, 10 4, 10 4, 10 4, 10 4. The, the satellite changes right here. The, the channel or whatever this is here just changes at the same time as well. What is this? Why is there this huge discrepancy? This is the time where they claim the plane is flying in the South Indian Ocean. Everything up here, 1840 UTC is the time where we think the plane got warped. How does anyone look at this and not see this giant discrepancy and go, hmm, that's weird? Especially because they say the ACAR system was turned off at 1707. Okay, so why is the data up until 1840 all solid and good? None of it makes any sense. So the ping data is weird. Um, if you want to know how and why, you can either rewatch the video or you can look at my frequently asked questions posts that I made. Uh, do I fear for my safety? No, I don't fear for my safety. I don't care. If anything happens to me, it was worth it. Also, if anything were to happen to me, it would only add more credit to the case. The case would blow up. If I was like mysteriously died, um, people would be asking serious questions and you guys would like take it to the next level. In addition to all my conspiracy... I mean, guys, I had my, my power supply blew out and I had like 50,000 views on my post about my power supply blowing out, which was pretty damn weird. I'm not going to lie. The sound it made was very loud. But I think it was probably just a normal thing. They should have taken my computer out a long time ago if they were going to take it out. Um, yeah, and again, so if you want to know about the, the why this plane, et cetera, watch the whole interview. You can come to your own terms about why, you know. And also for the people out there that want to think it's aliens or whatever, that's fine. I don't care. I understand. I mean, this technology in my mind is hundreds of years beyond where we're at. So if either the military is hiding technology is 100 years beyond where we're at. Or this is UFOs. But the thing is, when you look at the videos, they're tracking this plane. They're staring at and zooming in. They're flying super close to it right before this, this event happens. You either just got the one in a million random perfect shot of these orbs from aliens. Or, you know, this is our tech and it was an operation the whole way. This is why I'm pretty sure it's, a, it's our technology. To me, the question is, how did we get this technology? I don't think that we randomly got teleportation warp speed tech. Uh, I think that we figured something out and that, you know, we probably dug something up or we found some object that was like something that looked like it would defy the laws of physics. And then we were able to deduce it from there. And it turns out it's consistent with science as we know it. Um, it's just beyond technologically what we are currently think we're capable of. Okay. Now let's go to that. So there's your sketchy data. And then I talk about the phones ringing, which I'm going to skip past right now just for the sake of time because I'm getting tired. Uh, the real location coordinates here is pretty big. So we have a time frame of between four days and 72 days. Now, the interesting part is remember those coordinates I just mentioned? Those coordinates are indicated by those Immersat pings as being potentially the real location of where the plane actually was in the Nicobar Islands. Now, the problem here is that the raw telemetry data was not made publicly available until May 28th, 2014, in a 47-page report. Before that, there was just a graph. Even Mike Exner of the Independent Group didn't know that the satellite information could even be real until June of 2014. So how did a supposed hoaxer know exactly where to put the plane with the real locations of the, of the, of the plane and the coordinates over a week before the raw telemetry data was even made publicly available for people that and that's were, on the screen uh, and they can see that on the screen. Yes. In the bottom left of the satellite video, you can see it in the high definition version. Um, so we also even went ahead and we looked at the, uh, we looked at all the satellites. We actually found there's a low earth orbit satellite pair, uh, NRO or, um, USA 229, a Naval ocean surveillance satellite pair that was in the right location in the uh, Straits of Malacca that could have been staring right down at this location around 1840 UTC. I mean, what more do you guys want, chat? What more do you want? <laughs> we have coordinates showing the real location of the plane that weren't publicly available until a week after the video was published, uploaded and published. And we found spy satellite with a sister satellite next to it, capable of taking 3D stereoscopic imagery, consistent with the regicide on upload, the very first upload, staring down at the same coordinates at the same time where the witness was there seeing the plane. 
And people are like, oh, well, the clouds don't move enough. Well, dude, do you really think that we're looking through satellites? First of all, if somebody was making a fake satellite video in 2014, it would have been looking straight down because that's what all the movies showed satellites is working. We didn't even know they have satellites in low Earth orbit that can take imagery like this until 2019 when Donald Trump leaked the satellite imagery of USA 224. That's when we learned about low Earth orbit satellites in infrared. Because that's the exact type of image that Donald Trump posted. So how in the hell was somebody in 2014 able to come up with this idea of having an angled satellite? Makes no sense. There's way too much that just these videos have to be real because there's too much corroborating evidence. We literally looked up every single satellite and found the satellite in the right location, staring right down at our coordinates with the exact right payload that you would need to take the video. Or to like, and again, it's not just like taking video. It's like not me sitting here with my camera taking video. It's sending infrared data, sensor data in real time back to a ground basis. In the same way, where when we send a satellite to Pluto, the satellite going to Pluto is moving at like 30,000 miles an hour or something like that. But we get back crystal clear picture of Pluto. Why? Because you take the data and you send it to your ground based computer systems and they build the imagery. Same thing happening here. This could have been in the constellation of the Sibir system. Um, in fact, the regicide and non-version is a stereoscopic version. It's two different videos side or two. Yeah, two different. Okay, well, I already talked about that. Let's go to the 47, 45. Okay, and they don't do too much about the letter to Ash and Forbes. But man, that is creepy ass letter. If somebody did fake these, in my mind, it could only be some type of state sponsored event. It requires far too much intricate detail stuff that was not publicly available, like the heat signatures and the orbs uh, and the monopole stuff was not even publicly available to an Alto University paper after this plane went missing. Uh, far too many details in this for us to be just some kind of rogue person that created them. So a couple of things. So good question there. Are they are the satellites Lockheed Martin? I'm not sure. I, I don't think they would have to be. They add the satellites into the constellation is what they call it. And then the constellation is what's constantly sending the data to the ground-based systems to build what we presume is they must have some just log into the Google Video Earth military. And then you can just, okay, I'm going to go look at this point. Okay, was there, you know, probably depending on what type of coverage they had for the area, you're going to have different resolution. And I imagine there'll be like a screen that comes up on the side of the screen that says like, okay, here are the satellites that we had in range. This is the resolution we have. And then, boom, now you're watching a video of a certain area or place at a sp specific time. I don't know that for a fact. I'm not, I don't have access to that information. I'm, we've just been able to deduce this. Pretty wild, huh? Uh, but yeah, I am sure there's no privacy on this planet, by the way. So, guys, when you go outside, make sure you wave to the satellites. Just you know, brighten their day up a little bit, guys. Brighten their day. They're spying on us. It's a busy work to spy on us all the time um 53 minutes we talk about the citrix session this is another thing too where it's like exactly what i think happened when we are looking at that satellite video we can tell that they are doing a screen recording it's not somebody who's got a camera who's filming the screen like, like i would be doing here and that's one of the earliest details that i noticed and so when the sluice on social media found out that this was a citrix session logged into a database because of the mouse the mouse is at 24 frames per second that we see in the satellite video and it comes off the top right of the screen and goes off to the bottom left of the screen indicating they're looking at a much larger field of view but they're cropped it down removing the drone so that we wouldn't see that removing other information from it that's when i went holy crap this was a u.s military personnel who was recording this on a screen recording they knew they were going to get caught they have logs for Citrix sessions logging into databases like this. And they leaked this to the world, potentially because they knew the United States would never find it. And I was sitting there one day in October and I was going, wait a minute, I've got like a psychological profile for the person who would have leaked this. It would have to be a U.S. military personnel. They would be a patriot, most likely, that wants to tell the world. They remove the HUD data and all this other sensitive information. They leak the first video, thinking that maybe the world will pick up on that first video and they don't even need to leak the second one. And then when we ignore that, they drop the second videos in perfect synchronization. Now you've got absolute proof. We've got coordinates. We've got two different videos. So I started Googling, looking up people. It took me about two weeks because it's really hard to find some of this information that goes back, especially seven or eight years or more. And then I run across Lieutenant Commander Edward C. Lynn. 
I am 99.999% sure this is the guy right away. Every single thing. My, I've got my spider senses just going off. Signals intelligence all over his every single news article about him. The strange case of Lieutenant Commander Edward C. Lynn, completely redacted information, charged with espionage, but there's no evidence he exchanged any information with anyone from China. And that was unusual to me because if you think about the person that would have leaked this, the United States government would have assumed that they're trying to help China out, especially if it's an espionage event. But then if they find out that there's no evidence of that because it was just somebody who was trying to tell the world the truth, now it gets really awkward. He was actually a Taiwanese uh, national who had been naturalized into the United States, a guy that we trusted with our military or uh, nuclear weapons. So this was a guy that by all accounts was a patriot. But the circumstantial evidence is extremely damning. He was assigned to the VPU-2 Wizards, a secret spy plane uh, program, in February of 2014, right before the plane disappeared. His lawyer is on the record saying that the investigation into him began April 2nd, 2014, the next month after the plane disappeared. And that's when I went, oh boy, like this is a very narrow window of time, but there's more. <laughs> It was actually the lawyer, defense lawyer, argued that the classified information in question is available on the internet. Yahtzee! I mean, guys, the classified information is available on the internet. This is why it doesn't matter. We're, we're not trying this case in the court of public opinion. I don't give a shit what debunkers and UFOologists or VFX phony artists think. None of that matters. We've got a guy who went to prison, who was assigned a month before this plane went missing and investigated a month after who had two uh, pieces of classified information that were available on the internet. You tell me what evidence is available on the internet that they tried to throw this guy into prison for life over. That's the conclusion of this story. When you show me that evidence, and it's either the MH370 videos or not, that's how this story ends. The only way this story ever ends is the U.S. government comes out and admits they were filming MH370, and they tell us exactly what happened to that plane. Because we know they know what happened to the plane. Doesn't matter how many fake debunks and scammers come out there to fabricate bullshit. How many people with their YouTube followers say that they don't believe it can be real. I don't give a crap. We have way too much evidence. Way too much evidence that pinpoints the United States government being implicated in the situation. Um, and yes, for the person who asked, I do think this is the plane that was warped somewhere over to the Maldives and flown to Diego Garcia. I don't believe the satellite pings are accurate. Um, they could be misinterpreted, but I don't think that they are accurate. Which, if it's not these videos, why were they trying to get him in life in prison for espionage? And later on, ended up forcing him to a plea deal. And in the plea deal, just for disseminating classified information, he got a nine-year sentence, which is, excuse me, huge compared to what other people for similar offenses have gotten. Most people with that kind of offense, they get like a slap on the wrist or like a year. They actually had to have people testify as to what he did, why it was so damaging. Um, he was also caught with flight manifests that include search and rescue code names, which to me, this evidence piled together says this must be the guy. So I FOIA'd the FBI and NCIS. FBI wouldn't give me anything. They said it's privacy related. NCIS rejected my FOIA in total. I had the head of legal for FOIA respond back and sign the document saying it's to be kept secret in the interest of national defense or foreign policy. Now, wow. to me, I think, yeah, Clayton's reaction pretty much says it all there, chat. Wow. I FOIA the NCIS and their head of legal comes back and says, nope, it's got to be kept secret in the interest of national defense and foreign policy. What? I thought it wasn't a spy case. I thought the internet was a, the information was available on the internet. They won't give me anything about the case. They have to have people testify as to why what Edward C. Lynn was so damaging because they are they actually had to force him into a plea deal because they were afraid that if the case went to court that the evidence would become made public and then people would find out that it's the videos. I'm just sitting there like what do people think that Edward C. Lynn, Lynn went to prison for? Why is the why were they so desperate to get him to sign a plea deal so that they wouldn't have to show the evidence? Because the moment they show the evidence, they go, oh, we stole MH370. We can warp a plane. People would be having meltdowns. They can't explain those videos. They would have to have, hire me to explain to the humanity how that what we see in those videos can be real. 
Because even with all this evidence, people still don't think they can be real. The government comes out. Hell, I probably wouldn't even believe the government. If the government came out and said Edward C. Lynn leaked these videos, I'd probably be like, nah, that's fake. <laughs> they, they fake those videos. <laughs> the only reason why I believe it is because they're not saying that. And then I'm the one pushing the information out there. So pretty wild. Yeah, the semiconductor scientists, they probably either killed them or incorporated them back into, uh, you know, made them, made them live out their days with Diego Garcia. I don't know. Forced them into witness protection. Never talked to their families again. The answer is there's no, all the answers to what they did with the passengers are extremely dark. In fact, the whole story is dark because if we can do this, if Obama is implicated in this, people, people think that Obama is the greatest president ever. I, I, I thought he was one of the greatest presidents in, the, in my lifetime. And now I'm like, damn, Obama's into some dark shit. This is super dark. If we're pulling moves like this off and lying to the world like this, no one's going to ever trust the government ever again. Every, I'm never going to trust them ever again. Um, so, yeah, pretty wild stuff. Let's go back and do a couple we'll a couple more clips. We're almost done. It is. So, to me, a lot of people have heroes in the UFO disclosure realm. David Grush, Commander Fravor, Lou Elizondo, etc. To me, Edward Seelin is the hero. Because being a hero, it requires sacrifice. And that's what he did is he broke his NDA. He broke his oath to get that information out to the world. And he paid the price. He went to prison. He ended up getting six total years after they shaved off three years from his sentence for working with the FBI and NCIS. I think they convinced him that, hey, man, this wasn't UFOs. This was our secret technology. You just showed China. You just showed Russia. If we could figure this out from a social media account, then China and Russia's intelligence apparatus, I, I hope they figure it out. If they haven't figured it out, then they have no chance against us. Wow, you're blowing my mind. Oh, you're blowing my mind. So <laughs> that part too right there, people came at me like, why do you hope China and Russia figure this out? Do you not realize I'm being sarcastic right there? If China and Russia didn't figure out what we figured out, just some random dude on social media, then they have no chance against us. <laughs> no chance. We have warping plane technology. Um, so a couple of questions here. Someone says, with this much evidence, if they didn't warp the plane away at the end of those videos, I think there'd be so many more people interested. Absolutely. I wish there wasn't orbs and zapping in that plane in, in that video, because then we'd be able to prove that the plane was on fire because people would believe people have no problem with the fire scenario. But the problem is that the fire scenario proves that we warped the plane away. That's the reason why no one could look at the fire scenario. It's crazy the mental block people have. They can't see observable reality. They don't believe their eyes. They literally won't believe their eyes. <laughs> this is the part that's scary to me in general. But absolutely, you're correct. I think there's, and this is where people are like, Ashton, why don't you, you know, um, why don't you think this can be aliens? Or why don't you dig into 9-11 and all this stuff and all, or like add more layers to it? Or why don't you go to remote viewing? And I'm like, guys, we already have more than what people are able to comprehend with their minds. Way more. I don't even like to talk about the idea that aliens might exist. I don't think we're looking at aliens in these videos, but if people want to think that, that's fine. But I don't even like to talk about that because that's already like we're so far beyond the paradigm with just being able to warp a plane, you know, like then being like, oh, yeah, which kind of which species of aliens is your favorite? Do you prefer the mantids or the reptilians? Guys, like we're not even close to that conversation. If there are mantids, I, I'm on team mantids, by the way. I just think they're cool looking. I hope that they exist. Um, what if aliens created the Edward Seelin and the broadcast? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, we're thinking we're a little too deep in there, guys, too. And psyops exist, but not everything in the world is a psyop as well. Like, you've got to realize that people don't do things just for the sake of confusing people. Like, usually there's a plan. Like, if you want to confuse people... The PSYOP in this case is the suicidal pilot narrative and the idea that this plane crashed in the South Indian Ocean. That's the PSYOP. Why is it a PSYOP? Because it makes you not use your own brain. Anyone who uses their own brain knows that planes don't crash without leaving debris fields. They know that if we know the plane, we, if we have a ping that says this is where the plane ended its route, then we should find debris there. We should find a plane there. We should find black boxes there. We should have radar signals that are within range and see that. That's what a PSYOP is. A PSYOP says, ignore the your eyes and your ears and don't think for yourself and believe whatever we tell you. That's what a PSYOP is. So the South Indian Ocean narrative is a PSYOP. The suicidal pilot narrative is a PSYOP. It's not supported by any actual real evidence. 
It's just a psychological operation to get you to not think for yourself. Let's see what else we got. Okay, so then... Um, oh, the hiding the tech part. This There's only two more clips left I want to do. This part's really good, though. It, I bring up Dave Rossi again in this part. I talked about Joseph F. General Dunford. Definitely recommend you guys watch the whole thing. It's honestly an incredible interview. It's my favorite one I've ever done on hand so that people don't drive themselves nuts. Oh, okay, I went a little too far. It's essentially magic. On a whole other level. Yeah, there's two different aspects. By the way, I, I love Clayton. Clayton's like my favorite podcaster. He went like so far up the list so fast. I'm going to watch everything this guy ever does. I, I was so impressed when I spoke with Clayton and especially afterwards where I'm like, how much did you know about the case? Because he clearly was very well informed, but he also played it off like he was like, you know, asking questions the audience would want to ask. He's like, yeah, I knew about 80% of it, but I didn't know anything about the Edward C. Lynn thing. That's what he told me offline afterwards. And that's why when he said his mind was blown, he was being 100% honest. Um, super, just super impressive podcaster and interviewer. And it goes to show why he used to be like a Fox News anchor. Dude's a just consummate professional. Like I, I learned a lot from watching him where I'm like, damn, I want to improve my own podcast with this guy. So that I want to hit on here is that, uh, again, I've spoken to uh, Dave Rossi, who is a DOD contractor and engineer as well. And uh, I went on Tim Pool with him as well. Um, I've interviewed him twice, once with Salvatore Pius. And I think that he and I see eye to eye in terms of how is this information kept secret? The answer is really, really easily. And you've got engineers that are going into labs, special access programs, signing NDAs when they go in, having their phones taken away so they can't be used. They see technology as essentially magic. And then they have to go out and get in their car, their gas-powered car, see the pollution, see all the, the poverty, everything around them, and go, how do, you, how do you reconcile these two things in their head? You have to have staff psychologists on hand so that people don't drive themselves nuts. And then they may say, well, I want to do the right thing and get the information out there. People like Eric Weinstein would say, well, how can they hide this? People would come out and they would say something. No, they wouldn't. No, they absolutely would not. Not only are they a fear for their life, they have no benefit. Uh, look at what happens to the people that try to disclose anything like this. Look at Bob Lazar in general. The media will vilify them. Debunkers will crucify them and find any weakness in their past, any skeleton in their closet, and use it to discredit the things that they're saying out there. Um, and that's what I found is that it's not actually even hard to hide the information. It's easy to hide the information. It's too easy, in fact. And that's why the people like Salvador Pius, like my friend Dave Rossi, want to get the information out there because we've reached a point now where we're almost in a post-truth world where no one can believe anything to be real out there. And then the question is, how do you get this out there at all ever in the future? And this is where I think that it goes back to those warring factions in the government. Yeah, so that's the part. It's so easy to keep it hidden. The stuff about the staff psychologist, guys, Just I want you guys to wrap your brain around that is that they have to have psychologists on staff because they go to these special access programs and they see anti-gravity. They know it's real. And then they go into the real world. They get in their gas-powered cars. They know over Unity is possible, cold fusion. They get in their gas-powered cars, drive home. They got to lie to their families because their children are going, no, all that stuff can't even be real, blah, blah, blah. I've watched my favorite YouTuber and they were poo-pooing on the ideas. Like that's the disconnect that we are living in right now. We could have over unity and free energy warping objects from one location to another. And then we've got debunker type people out here that think that we are at the pinnacle of human civilization right now, that nothing new can ever be discovered. We've, we've figured it all out. And it's actually easy for these people, the people that are, I don't think they're like all being paid to lie, but the people that are cast doubt, the standard of evidence are not equal. Standard of evidence to proving it real is up here. Standard of evidence to debunk something is way down here. And what this leads is to what we call the post-truth world, where now we can't know anything to be true anymore, no matter what. And it's only going to get worse. The reason why these videos are so important is because they were proven to date back to 2014. And at this point going forward, AI... And deep fake technology has gotten so crazy good. 
that you're like never going to be able to prove any video to be real ever after this because it will always be able to claim that it was just AI. In fact, you could make the argument that, again, like the only people that could have faked the MH370 videos is the, a government, our government or foreign government using AI bef- that predates commercial AI, in my opinion, to create that. That's my personal opinion. Um, let me see here. And and again, like, uh, yeah, so I, I'm not trying to connect any more stuff on the outside to this. Like, it's already, we've, we've got a lot. And the scalar physics stuff and what have you, I'm going to do a couple more clips and then we'll talk quickly about what we're going to do tomorrow. And then we're going to close it out for tonight. I got to get some sleep. Um, I, I've been struggling the last few days. Where's the, whoops. Sorry, guys, I'm getting used to StreamYard here. Okay, so then I, I talked briefly about over unity, an extra dimension, an underlying construct to our reality that we don't perceive. And if we can tap into that, we can tap into the negative entropy of the universe itself. And then you also need to understand that space is not empty. And if space is not empty, then you can create over unity devices. You can cheat the laws of thermodynamics by opening your system up and you can borrow energy from the vacuum with a zero point energy to produce a system that puts more energy out than is put into it. This allows for free energy. We can also use superconductivity and super powerful magnetic fields to create fusion power. Now, the problem, like I said, though, is that you can then, like we saw in those videos, when the orbs are converging, to amplify the energy, as Salvatore Pius's high frequency gravitational wave generator patent says, amplify energy to such a degree where you can destroy a planetoid or asteroid. Scale that up, and now you can destroy a planet. Scale it up further, and you can destroy a sun. We might even be able to create a big bang with this type of technology. Okay, so, um, and I asked Clayton after this about his conversation with Tucker Carlson, which I think was really good. Um, Just for the record, and this is going to sound a little bit rude here, but I don't care what other people want me to do. I I get a lot of people telling me their opinions on how I should do my business and what have you. I don't listen to anybody that ever does that kind of stuff. I, I think it's rude to even tell me how I should do my stuff. I don't only I'm only reviewing this particular interview because I think it was the best one I've done so far. And I just think it's really good in general. Um, the last clip I want to do is show the, the thing about hope here. I've, we've had seen all these cases of drones that are incurring over our military bases. I would argue that that might be Russia and China with this type of technology. And um, I think as my friend who I've met now, Jake Chansley, people know him as the shaman on January 6th. Um, he's a very introspective guy. And he would say that you know, we might as well get this out there because the worst people in the world already have access to it. It can't get any worse right. on that from that perspective. From the UFOlogy people that I've spoken to, very prominent people in general, they would say that our fate is up to us. Whether or not we destroy ourselves with the, or not with this technology, that's up to us as humans to figure that out. I look at this technology and I see the hope in it in terms of ending poverty, uh, ending homelessness, ending hunger around the planet with this type of technology. Um, and that's the reason why I am on the side of the information coming out in general. But I think that we do have to put safeguards in place because the problem with this technology is figuring out a unification theory of the forces is that it's a Pandora's box. Once you open that Pandora's box up, you get everything that comes along with it. Even Eric Weinstein mentioned this on Jesse Michael's podcast with Hal Pudoff is that you can't just pick and choose what things you want. If you want the medical healing aspects, well, you also get the weapons that come along with it. So this is, I think, the the dichotomy, the issue that we face as a civilization. This is what my goal is in revealing and talking about this with you and other people as well, is I want to move the conversation forward. Everybody I see in UFOlogy is talking about the different types of species and uh, you know what they want to do with the species and what these crash retrievals Black mean, et cetera. I want to talk about what does the technology mean? What does it mean for our future? And how do we avoid obliterating yourself and oblivion in general? Okay. So that was the interview. Uh, couldn't be more grateful to uh, Clayton Morris for going over it. Uh, I do see people in the chat mentioning the X-37B. I think there are possibilities where they were spy reconnaissance craft, but I think that, um, and it's possible that that satellite video is actually some type of spy reconnaissance craft. Uh, but the reason why I don't think that is that the person who leaked it intentionally put in NROL 22 that was a very specific thing that they entered into that video. Uh, they could have just had the coordinates. I'm guessing that that was an overlay that was built into the software that they're able to put in there for intelligence purposes when they're showing like the president and stuff like that. 
Um, so I, that's the part of the reason why I, I don't think this is some kind of plane. Although I've, I've thought about that a lot in terms of like, maybe it's not really a satellite. Maybe it's something else going on. Um, so anyway, uh, let's see. I think that's it guys. I uh, appreciate you guys watching tonight. So tomorrow, what I want to do is I actually have a list of segments that I want to go over with the Thomas Bearden. So we went over Thomas Bearden psychotronics. If you guys want to Google that, you can watch the video ahead of time. We went over this a few weeks ago or like, yeah, maybe a week or two ago. And it's, I think, the best Thomas Bearden video, period. But we didn't have uh, the new nice layout going on. And we didn't have the streaming on X going on. So I want to go over it again. And I want to show the clips uh, that I think are important related to the technology. Because there's a lot of people out there that think that, oh, Ashton's just making this up. He's just using magical buzzwords. But no, this is actually science that goes back to tesla that has been proven by people like the ehrenhoff bohm effect maxwell's equations many 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 other scientists as well it really is a situation where it's potentially just being hidden from us so i want to play through a lot of those clips tomorrow in a similar context to show you guys you know how exactly we can explain what we see here regarding macroscopic phase conjugation and interferometry and how this works so that people understand that I'm not a scientist. I'm not an expert, an engineer or anything like that, but I have been trying to teach myself. And, um, you know, then you can come to your own conclusions as well. You know, if you think it's nonsense after you watch it and you see the historical references and the scientists that have been involved, that's fine. Um, and if not, then hopefully we can move into Star Trek world because what I want is if this technology is real, like I've said this a lot, but if this is fake, if these videos are fake, what have you, well, I guess we'll find the plane somewhere and I'll look like an idiot. In which case, you guys can all make fun of me. Uh, it was a good shot anyway. Uh, or the videos are real. And if the videos are real, then this pushes the paradigm. This might advance our civilization hundreds of years. Hundreds of years. Overnight. If we can prove to the world these videos are real, it will advance our civilization that far. So for me, it's worth the risk. You know? For me, I'm either going to look like some kind of hero psychic that pushed our civilization forward 100 years just by promoting videos that I didn't leak, that I didn't prove the science. All I did was show that the science was already out there. Or I'm going to become a huge joke in history for having tried and believed some fake videos that some secret Bitcoin billionaire that didn't want to collect $150,000 made because they were bored or whatever the story is. But either way, I'm all in on it. And thank you guys for being here with me tonight. I hope you have a wonderful night. MH370X, this has been awesome. I uh, hope you appreciate the show. Let's meet up again tomorrow night. Peace, everybody. Thanks. Oh, let me do my play out thing. I'm going to play this one again. The other one's too long. Malaysian 370, contact with Chimin 120, decimal 9. Good night. Good night, Malaysian 370. Breaking news tonight, a Malaysia Airlines flight with 239 people on board, including four Americans, has gone missing.